it, the brains on the sidelines may be great, but it doesn't matter if the brains on the field or not. Well, especially quarterback, right? right. You know, and so you got to have a quarterback who can implement what you're trying to get done out there. Nate Davis at Ball State is a young man that we're going to talk a lot about for the next four years. He has a dynamite arm. He can throw the ball down the field. He his eyes are always looking down the field. He'll throw it short. He'll work and he'll set things up. But Nate Davis is a heck of a football player. I can't wait to watch him play here tonight. Well, the on the other side, then you have Aaron O'Pelt, another true freshman. Aaron struggled a little bit throwing the ball. What can help Aaron throw the ball? Parmalee, the running back, who's had over two 100-yard games the past two games. Also, do not be surprised if you see a young man named Cochran at the quarterback position. Started at the beginning of the year, hurt his knee. He might see some action tonight. That's what somebody's telling us. As everyone knows, Todd Harris is our guy usually on the field. He'll be there a little bit later on, but right now he found a much more interesting spot. <laughs> John, I'm in Sylvania, Ohio at the epicenter of the House Divided. This is the Buckeye and Wolverine shop. They sell a little of everything. Michigan and Ohio State, they cater to all kinds. And with the big game less than four days away, we are 150 miles away from Columbus, Ohio. Folks here certainly have their opinion. We'll have much more about what people here in Ohio think about the outcome of the game. We'll talk about what started this whole thing. It goes back to 1835, the war for Toledo. Very interesting there. And we'll have much more on the BCS. Who's climbing? Who's falling? It all culminates on the BCS National Championship game. We'll be back to the Glass Bowl and more of Ball State and Toledo right after this. Into HD, presented by Pioneer Plasma. It's Ohio Week on ESPN and ABC. Tonight it all begins as the Ball State Cardinals travel to Toledo to take on the Rockets. Tomorrow night on ESPN2, about 20 miles down the road, we have another big game in the Mid-American Conference. That one will be Bowling Green against Miami of Ohio. And then on Saturday, it all culminates in the big game, Michigan and Ohio State, the national championship before the national championship. It's a great week for football, and Ohio is the place to be beginning tonight. Now. On the menu tonight, scheduled to join us is Rutgers head coach Greg Schiano, who, of course, has a dog in the hunt. Is this is how the saying goes as far as the BCS and Arkansas running back Darren McFadden, who won Mr. James, is starting to hype for the Heisman Trophy. Now, we'll tell you about the Toledo War of 1835. Not even the people around here know much about it. And, of course, we'll talk about the game, number two Michigan, at number one Ohio State. Chris Spielman, uh, I have, a, I have an idea who you might be pulling for now. Well, I'm completely <laughs> neutral, John. You know that. I'm a professional. Absolutely. <laughs> neutral up in the kickoff. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's a good week of football. People around the country talking college ball, and they're excited about it, looking forward to it. Toledo won the toss. They deserve, so, uh, part was deferred, rather, so Ball State. Terry Moss is back to receive. Mike Kropinski is the kicker. Moss hauls it in. Has a big opening and gashes right through the lane and fights his way up near midfield. Kropinski, the kicker, had to stop him. Otherwise, that one might have gone all the way. 32 yards on the game. You know, this is an offense that is going to be dynamite. The last thing Toledo needs to do is start the game, giving up a big, big kick return to Terry Moss. Moss is a big play guy for this football team and a great start for field position on the road. Anytime you have two evenly matched teams, field position is going to be a big part of this game. And what a way to start for Nate Davis in the Cardinal offense. Don't be surprised if they go up top right away to set, set at home. Well, they got two wide outs on the left. Drop back to handoff. Goes to Bostic. Four yards on the run. Steve Morrison with the tackle. As we look at our impact players, guys, the guys who catch the ball are going to be very important tonight for Ball State. Darius Hill, a tight end. I can't wait to watch him. Love and Moss, two other high-powered players on this offense. This is an offense, Chris, you're talking about. They will go down the field. Well, absolutely, and he's 6'6", 230 pounds. You and I are watching him before the game. He's a big space eater. Pitch to Boss this time. Great job by Alston to catch him for a loss of about two yards. Got him in the backfield. And Mike Alston, the senior leader, what happens, they pull two guys. He beats both coolers and comes in and makes a great play. 
take a look at the rest of the Ball State starting lineups. Well, as their coach tells them, Stan Parrish off at the corner, he says, we got peanut ball carriers and we got a peanut <laughs> offensive line. So you could put the peanuts in a six-man van, he said. And we got some youth on that line as well. So this team figures to be strong for some years to come if they can develop those players. We've got four wideouts on the field as Nate Davis works out of the shotgun. Drops back, throws it to the sideline. Very close to a first down. Darius Hill grabbed it before Walter Atkins falls him down. Eight yards on the game. You mentioned four wide receivers, and that's what he's deciding he wants to be, a tight end or a wide receiver. He's a hybrid, Johnny's and Craig. He's between that big, tall tight end that can split out, which causes matchup problems for strong safeties because of his size, and it causes a matchup problem against linebackers because of his speed. Yeah, you see those 10 touchdown receptions. Hill was a basketball player, premier kid that ever since he said he could remember, he played basketball and throughout the summer about his junior year of high school, decided to go out for the football team, wins a position, obviously, with the vertical jump he has, and a, a guy that not only will play in the slot, but he'll play out wide as well. We'll see him motioning a bunch tonight. Stan Parrish, offensive coordinator, said he wants to move him to get the matchups that he wants. Just inches from the first down, fourth down, they're throwing three tight ends, so it looks like they're going to go for it early on here in the game, and why not at this point? And they do like to throw the ball on third and short, fourth and short. They're not afraid to do it. Leading just inches, though. You see Nate Davis talking to Larry Bostic, and now they want a timeout. The wristband didn't correlate with the play. So he's looking around. This wristband's not working. I need to go get a new wristband. Hey, it's Tuesday night, man. You got to get it going early on. School night. Over the sidelines for a new wristband or a new play. Stick around. We'll get back to Toledo and the glass bowl in a moment. Ball State going for it on fourth and inches. They're eight out of 15 on fourth down conversions this year. The pitch goes to Bostic. And Toledo says, uh-uh, big stop in there by Barry Church. You can watch missed tackles right here, missed block, missed tackles. Brad Sawyer comes up and misses the block. And, 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 and it's really an off, it's an offense that's a finesse offense trying to get to the outside. They're wanting to get leverage. Right there it's a missed block by Sawyer's, and Church does a good job of not giving one for one, defeating the blocker, Craig, and making the play. Must be a good one. Spillman tight. Just hey, he just delivered the sermon. <laughs> Time for church. That's what the sign said. Davis shall not get first field. down. Sorry, John. No problem. Tossed out to Davis. Following his blocking. Busts it up for a first down. Josh Powell with a nice big block to open up the field to get that first down. Look at the Toledo impact players. See Jalen Parmalee over the last two games over 200 yards rushing. They gave him opportunities. Chris Hopkins, a big tight end, and Steve Odom. Anytime you can have threats in the backfield on the line and split out wide, you can become a balanced offense to help your young quarterback. Parmalee has been running terrific. We saw him last week against Northern Illinois, and he was a difference in that game. Here he busted through, and you see his power. That's one thing, Craig, we noticed last week. He gets yards after the hit as well. And we don't see a lot of penetration against that Toledo offensive line. They've, they've become a much solid, more solid unit, and Chris, that's why they've had the success with Parmalee running the last two weeks. But you got to commit to the run, and you look at his carries earlier in the season. He was getting 10, 11, 12, 13 carries. Well, when you have a struggling quarterback that's a true freshman, commit to the run, and good things will happen because it gets the offensive lineman excited about getting physical. Parmalee alone in the backfield with three wideouts. Back to pass, it's Opelt. He's chased down and sacked with a gain of one, so it's not a sack technically, but he is brought down after just picking up a yard. Coroma with the tackle. A look at the Toledo's starters. Yeah, John Gecko there, offensive tackle that certainly has caught the attention of some NFL scouts. Saw a guy down there from the Giants today. Big guy on the left side there. He'll stone you for sure. We got the five DBs in there. It's out. They're coming. Opel tosses out of it. 
headed for Chris Hopkins, but that one is incomplete. So it's fourth and four. Here's the lineups we started to give you, and you mentioned John Greco. This is a guy who's going to be a first-round draft pick, likely. Well, I just watched him on that play, and the one thing when you have big guys like Greco at over 300-plus, he's a knee bender, and he moves his feet well. He, he made a block on a punt. Yes. Return last week. He's the protector, a tackle. <laughs> yep. He and I mean, and the guy was unbelievable in open field on a little guy. Turn with the punt. B.J. Hale is back there to field it, and he will get it. Another catch at about the 13-yard line. 27 yards on the punt, and Ball State will go to the offense when we come back. Well, there's a look at downtown Toledo. The Glass City. Ball State and Toledo scoreless here early in the first quarter. Ball State going to the offense. They failed on a fourth and inches play. Turned it over to Toledo on downs, and they could do nothing with it either. Two tight ends in there with Bostic in the backfield. Quick snap. Back to pass is Davis. Out to the sidelines, and his receiver, Michael Steinhaus, caught the ball with his knee on the ground, so the play immediately dead before Greg Hay came over. Let's take a look at the Toledo defense now. One of the things that's hurt, one of the things that's hurt Toledo so far is their youth on their defensive front, and you see the freshmen that are starting, and they're getting better. As, and as the more experience they have, the more confidence they become, and the more success they'll have, but they've improved is what you want to see from young defenders. Summers has actually jumped in there as well for Forrestal. Snap again to Davis out of the shotgun. He has a man, and that's what he does so well, go downfield to Terry Moss. That's the poise right there of a young freshman quarterback keeping his eyes down the field, not being hassled or harassed by the rush, but his eyes stay downfield where he's delivered the ball on Tom on target. And look at the slot. 88, there's your tall receiver in the middle, right? 88 Hill. Here's what's happened here. Everybody's got a lot of focus here. Sit in the zone and let the quarterback find you. And Moss did a good job of recognizing zone and sitting that pattern down. Spreading the field out again. Quick hand off to Bostic, fights his way to the left before he's hunted down by Greg Hay. Six yards on the game. Well, there's Darius Hill. You talk about the route he just ran, Craig, and the pass he just made. Now to become the complete ball player, if he stays on that block, he's still running. He's got to handle that. He's got to be able to handle that defensive back and hang on it. He, you know what? As a former basketball player, he's, he's putting some weight on. Probably could put 25 more pounds on and be no problem with it, but he just has to... The, the total game, when he brings that all together, he's got a lot of upside. Bostic and Lynch were back there. Pass is going deep from Davis, but it's a little bit too deep, headed for Moss, and just over his hands by about 10 yards. He was guarded by Greg Hay, gave him a little push. Now, Saturday night, ESPN and ESPN2 offer up two important college football games. First on ESPN2 at 7 Eastern, 14th ranked Wake Forest, 9-1 for the first time in school history, hosts the 19th ranked Virginia Tech Hokies. Then on ESPN at 745 Eastern, Heisman candidate Ray Rice and the 7th ranked and undefeated Rutgers try to keep their national title hopes alive against the Cincinnati Judgment Day, part of rivalry week here on ESPN and ABC. Davis again out of the gun, and again across the middle. Big hit by Greg Hay, broke that one up. Yeah, Greg Hay came with some bad intentions right there. I love the fact that he's coming high. You get tired of seeing guys tackling guys in the knees and not bringing their arms. Watch Greg Hay, he's coming high, then he's bringing his arm and trying to get a little, little head with him, a little decapitation. Catch the football. That ball's in your hands, catch the ball. Don't worry about those guys in the that's middle. Normal. You, can't that's, hurt. That's, you can't hurt a guy that's, catching that's, the ball like that. Normal <laughs> behavior for running backs, the duck. No, man. Well, Dante Love weighs 170 pounds. Huh? Wide receiver. Hey, weighs Put a necro on. Put a necro on. You'll be all right. <laughs> so we got the punt. Steve Odom back to receive. Chris Miller is the punter. As neither offense has been able to mount anything thus far sustained. That was almost blocked. 
Odom has to chase it down inside his own 10. Now looking for a spot to break free, and there just isn't one there. He's swarmed. Dante Love is the first guy to him, and then Swarmer brought down 54 yards on the kick. He lost four yards. Now, we know there's a big game coming up later. We're going to talk about just how this war between Ohio and Michigan started. Todd Harris has a story when we come back. Everyone knows about the big game Saturday between Michigan and Ohio State, but what most people don't know is exactly how that war between the two teams in the two states started. Todd Harris does, though. Well, I don't know if I know all the facts, but I can tell you this much. I know more than a lot of people here in Toledo. It was really the battle for the Toledo Strip, and I think, John, you're onto something. This may be the genesis of why the Michigan Wolverines and the Ohio State Buckeyes don't like each other. But when I went walking around town the other day, not a whole lot of people knew about the War of 1835. Do you know anything about the Toledo War of 1835? I know nothing about it. <laughs> do you live in Toledo? I do. Born and raised in Slovenia, actually. You don't know anything about the Border War? I don't. I really don't. Do you know anything about the Border War of 1835? No. Do you live in Toledo? Yes. The Border War of 1835. Does that ring a bell? No. Let me ask you this. Do you know anything about the Toledo War of 1835? We lost. We, we got Toledo. <laughs> What can I say? Now, not everyone shares her sentiments. A very small number of folks were involved, and I'm happy to say there were no loss of life the way it should be. The dispute was over a strip of land that both Michigan Territory and the state of Ohio wanted. It was called the Toledo Strip. In the end, fortunately, politicians got involved, and they gave Michigan the UP. John, I know you're happy about that, and Ohio got Toledo. Imagine that, a resident of Toledo saying, we lost, we got the UP Toledo. <laughs> Barmley in the backfield. All the way into the end zone, takes the handoff, tries to fight his way to the left, and again, after contact, gains a couple of yards before Brad Slice gets in there to take him. Now, this Michigan-Ohio State game, if we try and be objective about this, gentlemen, the Buckeyes have been ranked number one all year. Michigan came up from being ranked as low as number 14. Who's been the more impressive team to you this year? Well, I think Michigan has surprised me the most with where they've come from and that, that Henny and Hart are doing what they are. And I think Michigan, I'm really looking forward to seeing how they perform against a big-time opponent. Look Woo! at Parmley bust it through the line and take off across the 50, the 40. He's not going to be caught. 10, 5, and into the end zone for the touchdown. 92 yards on the run. Anytime you have size and speed like that and you get to the second level and safeties take poor angles, Carmelie does have that ability as what he's shown the last few weeks. You see the linemen of Toledo get it up to the second level and Craig, they don't get him if it's two-hand touch and right there it's just a straight foot race and the big fella beats the little fella to get gold. A huge hole opened up for Parmley, and he just ran right through it. Steigerwald for the extra point. It's up and it's good. And so Toledo has a seven to nothing lead. How did that hole get so big? That would be the offensive line, John. <laughs> Toledo's offensive line, they ran back to back the same play. A little zone run stretch read over here. Parmley, we said last week, we thought he had really good vision, but you're gonna see that there's a lot of reaching and they're looking for that hole. And the offensive line at Toledo, no pen penetration, and Parmley has good vision. We talked about having eyeballs on his feet last week and how he runs so well. And, and it just, you know, we, we stuck and froze right there. But the bottom line is, a big guy like that, for all you young kids out there who talk about, you know, you're afraid to lift weights and everything, that you might get slower, strength is why Parmalee scored this touchdown and outran the back, the secondary. He had strength, he had he had stamina, and it's a strong, uh, good, talented runner. Well, here's you talking about the blocking right here, and see if Ball State is not gap sound. Watch how this opens up right there. Sykes gets cut off. He's getting the wrong gap. They have no corner support. The safety's over favoring the trip side. That and linebacker again, didn't get in there, Chris. No, he, Did you see the linebacker stop? He got stopped? cut off. He, got, he, got, he was afraid to put his nose you in the know, hole. What he's got to do is he's got 
got to run over the top and run through and take care of your gap responsibility. Toledo set him up, though. Toledo had three to one side. Coming back to the left side, the rotation of the defensive backs was to the left. They busted one to the right with no support. Next thing you know, he's on a highlight film. He'll be on the, uh, he'll be on top plays, maybe. You better believe it. That's a career-long run for Parmalee and second longest in school history. Terry Moss will be back to field the kickoff from Rubinsky. Toledo scores in a hurry. His kick is short. Good pickup getting it across the 35 yard line is Alex Nip. On the return. You see Parmley right there had a few issues of, of holding and fumbling the ball, but there, opportunity, taking advantage of your opportunity. Toledo made the, the conscious decision to give him the football. As you see, 13 rushes, 69.8 yards per game. The first eight, well, they bring a new quarterback in. He's struggling. Hey, wait a second. We got this guy named Jalen Parmley that can do some damage with the ball. Let's just keep feeding them. Feed the horse. But it was a young team, yeah. and, and Amstutz had to figure out what he had, and they're working on it. They feed that horse. Let him run. Bostic with a pickup of four yards. For Derek Summers is there to bring him down on the tackle. And just to go back to that, Tom Amstutz know what it's like to feed the horse because he had Chester Taylor here. And when you have a back that's putting those kind of numbers up, you have to give him the carries. And to me, you've seen him last week, Craig. I saw him on film. To me, the more he gets, the stronger he gets. Bostic again in the backfield with Nate Davis out of the shotgun. Coming after him, Davis has to sidestep a tackle and then toss deep where he's got his man pulled in beautifully by Terry Moss. Great hands on the catch. It starts with two things. First of all, it starts with Nate Davis being able to avoid the rush right here. You're going you're gonna to see for uh, Bernard Faithful come in, and Austin's going to come in here first to set it up. Then you'll see number 90 come around on the late stunt. Watch this. There's the late stunt inside. Nate Davis does a great job of avoiding, keeping his eyes downfield, which a lot of court, young quarterbacks don't do. Moss adjusts on the football. Faithful comes in, has a chance to make a play, misses it. Davis makes him pay. 36 yards on the game. Back to passes Davis again. He's going to the end zone. Moss is up and pulls it in. Hold on, boys. 24 yards. Stan Parrish came out and he's run the ball more than we thought he would. I want you to notice that Doug Flutie sitting at home right now is loving this guy. Throws off the back of his foot right. and he's got the strength of his arm to get it to the end zone. He's buying a little extra time for his receiver to break open. And the other thing he does well, when you're long, you're never wrong. He threw that ball where only Moss could get it. Nigel Morse was caught in front. And what he's taught to do is throw that back pylon, exactly what young Nate Davis did. Off the back foot, as you said, Craig. Brian Jackson was the extra point. It's good, and just like that, we are tied up at seven apiece. And I want to tell you that that young quarterback showed a lot of poise on those two passes. He stepped up in the pocket the first one, and then, as you said, off the back foot the second time. You, you, sometimes you can sense that the coaches who've been around a long time, like Stan Parrish, they, they, they recognize something. And, and Brady Hoke, he was smart enough as a head coach to make the change. He recognized Lynch, their other quarterback, had done a nice job and has had a lot of success here at this school. But it was time. It was time to make the change, and Davis gives them something that they can really build on. Well, you could see why if you're building for the future, then you got to go with the young fella. And, and you know, wasn't highly recruited, but a great basketball player telling me he's a great athlete. Just a vision right there is the two quarters. Joey Lynch was doing a pretty darn good oh, yeah. job. Yeah, and he's had a heck of a career but he, and an unselfish player. But but Parrish coached, when I got to know Stan, was when he was at Rutgers coaching with Coach Grable. And, and they had Ray Lucas, right. and Lucas was number two, and he took a long time before he made him number one. And Parrish said, I learned my lesson back then. When a guy's ready to go, I don't care how old he is, put him in there. Yeah, you talk about Lynch, you know, for a young quarterback to develop, John and Craig, you have to have a guy that's willing to help him come along, that's been out in the field and sees the things that coaches don't see. Fifth in school history, and the guy's unselfish. 4,300 yards and all those touchdowns are unselfish. Uh, a lot of admiration Absolutely. Uh, for Joey Lynch. That's a great point. There's a lot of quarterbacks would be sitting over there sulking right now. Brian Jackson with the kickoff. Parmalee and Odom back to receive. 
Parmalee is going to get it at the one yard line. The big fella breaks it across the 25 before he's brought out of bounds. Already 200 yards of total offense in the game. Well, it's a perfect night, too. Uh, the coaches and both players, teams' players on this field warming up. And we're down there, Chris, and they're like, man, there's no wind for this time of the year in Toledo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it, so seeing Coach Hoke down there in like Stan Parish, and I said, we're going to see the ball in the air tonight. And just kind of gave a little wink and a smile. And, yeah. you know, the running game is just a diversion. Here, we're going to run it just to run it. But they're going to they're gonna toss the rock all over the place. Davis in the backfield, as Parmley had the carry on the kickoff return and Davis is brought down behind the line of scrimmage. It's a loss of two. Wendell Brown was the one who got to him first. That's going to be a test of wills right here, guys. Is Toledo going to stick with the run? And Ball State, they see what we see. They understand they have a freshman quarterback that doesn't have a lot of success. So what we're going to do is we're going to pile people up there. And if you want to beat us, start throwing the ball down the field. Not little swing passes, down the field. Davis alone back again. It's Opelt is directly behind the center. They'll send three wideouts. Now he wants to think about it and call a timeout. Maybe he didn't saw something he didn't like on his wristband. This weekend. Really, Craig, you and I sit with Doug Flutie in the, in the studio every Saturday, and it, it was just absolute craziness. It began Thursday when Rutgers beat Louisville. Greg Schiano, who may join us later on tonight, and it was just bedlam there. And then Auburn lost to Georgia. That one came out of nowhere. Absolutely nowhere for Georgia to come out. Three interceptions by this young man, and then for the Kansas State Wildcats to smack the Texas Longhorns. That was the stunner for me for the weekend, even though they lost Colt McCoy. And then you've got California losing to Arizona. And out west, we can't figure out. Way to go, Mike Stoops. We can't figure out what the pac is all about. And we had no idea what the BCS standings would look like after that weekend. But the Trojans are up there again with a chance to play in their fourth consecutive game that would be for a national championship should they get to that game at the end of the season. And they got a great chance if they run the table and of course Michigan or Ohio State is gonna lose, they're gonna be right there again. Parmley now back in the backfield. Big strong back with a 92 yard run. Gets the handoff, cuts his way to the right and then back to the left before he swarm tackled. Brought down first by Booker. A two yard gain. What about USC? I mean, they're, they've kind of quietly, they left the map. <laughs> All of a sudden, Chris, they, they're well, back in it. Yeah, they don't do anything uh, quietly. But I, I, again, an argument, there's so many arguments and formulas you can use, and we'll talk about this as the show progresses. But I'm one, and I think I'm in the minority, where if Rutgers wins out, beats West Virginia, and goes undefeated, then they've got to have the opportunity, in my opinion, to give it a shot. So you're not in the minority in this booth. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Opel is chased out. He's going to try and run for the first down, but not going to get there. Eight yards on the pickup. Trey Lewis got there before he could get to the first down marker. I was just going to say, that that's a difference right there. We'll see the BCS standings. We'll get back to that. But, right, when you have Rutgers that beat a number three Louisville, then they'll have a number eight West Virginia. If they can win number three and beat a number eight in the BCS, then they're in the BCS conference. I, agree with <laughs> I just I, 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 I constantly get in this argument. I don't understand why everybody doesn't agree with us, John. DJ Hill calling for a fair catch and has it. I, I, I agree. If you are in a BCS conference, and thus the BCS as it, as it is set up is saying you are equal amongst these six conferences and Notre Dame. I don't understand how you could possibly justify having an undefeated team from one of those conferences be bypassed by a one-loss team in another one of those conferences. If, if Rutgers, I'm with you now, Chris, if Rutgers is undefeated and they win in the Big East and you don't let them play, then go ahead and kick the Big East out. 
Well, the other thing is, too, they talk about the strength of schedule. You can look at all teams and say the strength of schedule because you don't know from year to year what conference is going to be strong or what conference is going to be weak. It just depends on the teams. The Big Ten and the Big East is good. Yeah, the Big Ten has three good teams and eight average teams. Davis just tossed that at the feet of Boston wisely. But, but you know, this, this whole scenario, John, you've said this for a while now, that you really like the way we have this structure because every week means right. something. I'm, I'm jumping on board with you a lot more every week watching these games because it's do or die. Well, it's like a, I say that college football has a playoff right now. It begins September 1st, and it runs it does. through the beginning of December, and that's what I love. But, it, but we can't mess around a team like Rutgers if they have a great no, season. No, I agree. I agree. Spread in the field with four wideouts again as Nate Davis out of the shotgun. Back to pass and again looks downfield, has his man just across the 30-yard line before he is brought down. Dante Love picks up five yards. Flutie would love this guy because he's using the, the, the chains. He's moving it, not being impatient. I'll tell you, the other thing Doug would like is his release. I mean, that ball's out in a hurry. There's not a lot of wasted motion. One of the unique things about Mr. Davis is that he throws the ball how he gets it. He doesn't necessarily work his fingers around to the seams. If he, if he doesn't get the seams, he doesn't care. He's got huge hands, and he throws the ball without the seams. Even in warm-up, he threw the ball with his thumb on the laces. Right. There are very few quarterbacks capable of doing that. A couple in the NFL. Davis again just throws that one a little bit deep and out of bounds. It was intended for Terry Moss, but he was under such pressure coming from Barry Church and Steve Morrison that he had to release the ball. So fourth down and four yards. I, I, I tell my son Andy, who's a corner, I said, judge a quarterback's arm early in the game so you know what you got to cover. He, Chris, he, Davis threw that ball 35 yards, falling backwards. And it did a fadeaway. And I, I don't think it's by design. It's by survival because Toledo is doing a good job of getting pressure. But again, Coach Parrish told us, I don't try to overcoach this kid. If he can get it off his, if he can stand on his head and throw with his left hand and his two toes, let him throw it that way. <laughs> Chris Miller, the punter, throws a fake. Incomplete. Ball was dropped. Brad Wilson would have worked. Yeah, Brad Wilson had a whole shot at holding a whole field. It was a great call by Brady Hoke. You can see they're playing for something right here. They got everybody committed to blocking the punt. Here comes the pressure right there. They forget about Mr. Wilson. Wide open, too wide open. Uh -huh. You got to be able to make that catch. Rule is hit your hands, get it. What a great call though. Uh, ugly yeah, looking pass. Tough catch. That's a that's a tough catch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh, he's right. trying to catch it. <laughs> I'm top top. I can't help you it. Got both of you guys are. Davis in the backfield takes a handoff and it immediately is swarmed and he'll lose a couple of yards. Four yard loss on that one. But I think what Hoke, Coach Hoke is saying there is I got an offense. I'm going to score some points tonight. And I'm willing to roll the dice a little bit here. And we're wanting to finish five and three in the conference. Right. And after Parmley busted one, they've done a good job of defending the run. So what he's doing is he's making a statement not only about his offense, but he's saying defense, I trust you. If we don't get it, I know you guys will come and do something. That's a lot of trust because they gave him good field position here. Davis again in the backfield, but Opel is back to pass. Tosses it off to Davis. Weaves his way across the 35-yard line for a four-yard gain before Eric Keyes is there to stop him. Is there ever an excuse, Chris, for defense not to get 11 hats to the football? No. Well, unless you have man coverage away from a screen pass and you're covering your wide receiver, yeah, there's an excuse for it. Because I saw more white jerseys get into the ball there. And and if you've got Parmalee hot on the other side or a good runner, you better get to the football. Davis again in the backfield as we got a third and ten. Did you think that was a trick question or something? You, I had you to think looked about it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you, Pony. I worked with you. Before, I know, buddy. I'm working on it. <laughs> Opel almost loses the snap. Now that ball comes loose. He's going to be down. That's not going to be a fumble, but he mishandled the snap. Something happened on the exchange. We're talking about it. I didn't see. A, I didn't see, I didn't see the bean bag, bag fly or yeah, see anybody blow the whistle. They changed but it. But they're going to review this. Let's see. I, I've seen a lot of magic happen up in that room, John. I don't know. I don't know. That that looked yeah, like you know never what? had possession. That that would be the only way 
they could rule as a fumble is if they're saying he never had possession of the football because the ball did not come out until he hit the turf. Does he have possession? Oh, the ball his, knees, his knees are down there. Yeah, yeah. The ball was stripped by Cortland Booker, who was the guy that stripped the ball actually from Michael Hart. You see Ball State coming out here running a play before the replay got to look at. You know, obviously, the replay officials agree with the guys on the field. Deep pass for Moss. Has it in his hands and just cannot corral it. <laughs> 60 yards down the field. Man, this youngster can throw the football. And I'm telling you, Chris, the defense just doesn't realize how deep they got to get. Yeah, absolutely, Greg. And what happens is when you have defensive backs look back instead of run to the man, the ball was thrown, you say 60. But I'm telling you, that 60 was on a rope. It wasn't. It didn't take long to get out of there today. It no, wasn't P for K. Uh-uh. That ball came with some velocity. He just continues to impress. Almost stuck in Moss's face mask. Now, Bo Martin was the guy who got beat on that play deep. And again, they're going to stick with Davis. Tosses it again just into the turf. Throwing it away. Good recognition by the front four of Toledo. A feeling of soft blocks by the offensive line. If you feel like you're beating, beating them too easy, chances are you're not. So you kind of get on their hip and just chase them down the line. Great recognition by the Toledo front four. All of them. It looked like a, a, the Rockettes going in course formation over there. Whatever that is. Well, it's that time of the season, you yeah. know, for Radio City Rockettes to break out. You, you would know what those are, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you guys hang out in New York. I'm in New York. I'm aware. P.J. Hill is in the backfield now. <laughs> On a third down and ten. Davis across the middle has his nine, but that's going to be a gain of just four before Dante Love is corralled up. So it's going to be a fourth and long. They'll come back to that play. They had, they had B.J. Hill running wide open free. They will come back to that play. Quarter comes to an end, and we've seen some interesting offense here. Could this be a precursor to Saturday's big game between Michigan and Ohio State? We'll find out. Second quarter's coming up. Welcome back, and you know this is the Glass Bowl, and they call Toledo the Glass City, and you're seeing some of the beautiful artwork that can be done. I was always a little bit too fearful to get to things that were that hot, but it's a beautiful artwork here, and that's why it's called the Glass City. The punter is Chris Miller. Steve Odom is the lone man back. He stands at his own 21. Has to come up to get this one at the 25 and is immediately cut down. 43 yards on the punt before B.J. Hill was there to take him down. Now we talked about the replay rule and we talked to the Ball State coaches and they said if they had to vote again on the replay rule, they would vote against it because they don't have the same angles in every game. Network games have different angles than other games and so they don't believe in it. Now they got benefited this time around, but a Coach Amstutz, we're told, could have challenged it and decided not to, Todd. Yeah, he was right there, and the official looked at him and asked him, are you going to challenge us? Because immediately he was going to when the play happened, and he just lifted his hand and said, now forget it, waved it off. Clint Cochran has stepped in at quarterback, something that they told us we might see tonight. Parmalee in the backfield. Cochran's going to pass, but then has to step up as the pocket collapses completely around him, gets it back to the line of scrimmage before he's brought down. Here's the deal. If you don't threaten to throw the ball down the field or make some throws down the field, what happens is that everybody starts sitting on routes. And if you don't start getting the ball down the field, Ball State's just going to keep creeping up there, creeping up there. They're going to defend a short route, and more importantly, they'll have enough people in the box to take away what Toledo does best and that's running the football. Now, Coach Amstutz said that they felt like Cochran had made enough progress during practice and looked good enough that they wanted to give him a shot. Well, his shot is going to come after a timeout because he's decided he needs to come to the sidelines before he can move on with this. 13.50 to go in the first half. There are so many fans here in Toledo that actually root for the University of Michigan. It's actually much closer to Ann Arbor than it is to Columbus. 
So as we get ready for this one, they're sure to be divided down the stands who they're pulling for. ABC's your home for the most anticipated matchup of the college football season as the Michigan Wolverines visit Heisman hopeful Troy Smith and number one ranked Ohio State Buckeyes in the battle of unbeatens. The winner will win a trip to the BCS Championship Judgment Day, part of a rival week presented by Remington on ABC Saturday, 3.30 and 8 Eastern. Of course, that big game between Cal and USC comes at 8. Cochran in at quarterback again. Parmalee in the backfield. He takes the toss. Look at the quick feet. And then the power. He's got it all. Anderson with the big block that freed him up. You know, you see the vision that he has to push. There's linebacker coming from the inside out, 42 pushing hard, and it, it makes Parmalee stay to the outside. A lot of running backs forget how much room they have outside those numbers. You know, absolutely. The thing I like is he didn't go for the sidelines. He went ahead and looked for the contact and shot it up inside to get the extra yards. He's a big bruising back. How about those numbers? Five carries for 109 yards. You like those averages? Takes it again, and he'll have the first down. As he only needed a yard and picked up two. The progression of this young man has come very quickly, Todd. Yeah, no question about it. You know, Craig James earlier speculated that this young man certainly is a powerful one. He's been hitting the weights, and kids shouldn't be afraid to hit the weights. Well, I got another theory. Jalen Parmley comes from a family of ten children, seven brothers and two sisters, so he had to be quick to get to the dinner table and handle the power to get in there and grab the last steak. That's a good one, Todd. <laughs> Seven brothers, three sisters, is that what Todd said? Seven brothers, two sisters, two ten sisters. kids total. Yeah, I'm slow on math now. Now hang with me. It's like eating pregame meal with you two. <laughs> Had to bring my old linebacker skills up. Karoma was there. Part of the stop. You know, you talk about the the proximity of Ann Arbor to Toledo, and, and I tend to remind folks and uh, that they live in Toledo, Ohio. Right. They're, they're, they're here. We won you in the war. Remember? <laughs> the, the Toledo War? We, we got stuck with you. Exactly. You got to root for Ohio State. You're <laughs> so close to Ann Arbor, though. <laughs> Three wide outs. Cochran's still in at quarterback, and he hands it underneath to Parmalee. Gains three yards. Cease is there to bring him down. What it does, though, it gives him a manageable third down situation. And, you know, again, until Toledo makes the conscious decision to throw the ball down the field, if I'm Ball State, I'm going to get up there and challenge and challenge and challenge. 123 yards on the ground for Toledo. DeJuan Collins is now in at running back. Cochran throwing to the sidelines, has his man for a first down. Steve Odom over there hauls it in. There's a flag on the play. <laughs> Cochran got hit late. That might be the call. That's what it looks like. You see Cochran out there showing some emotion. That was good recognition. The zone blitz comes down from the right-hand side of the field. Cochran's left. He's looking left. He sees the pressure. So where's the weakness? If the pressure is coming from the left, the weakness is on the deep out from the right. Cochran turns and fires immediately, trusting his players and trusting his vision. Coach Amstutz and among others say that's the, the roughing the passer. Number 44 in the defense. 15 yards. First down. And that's his strength, is knowing where to go with the football in a hurry in recognition of the zone blitz. See right there. He sees that zone blitz coming right from the, his left to the right. Oh, man. Blow to the head. Cochran yeah. with a blow to the head. That's Can't a, do it. Touch, touch to the head. Should be a seven and a half yard penalty. <laughs> First penalty of the game as well. Underneath to Collins. And he gains just one yard. By the way, Craig, I, I know you want to hear this, okay? If Steve Odom had that last reception, that's a 48th consecutive game with a catch. Now, when we said 47 last week, you looked at me like I was crazy. Well, that's just a lot of games to play in college football where you <laughs> caught a ball. I mean, this is a, Chris, 48 straight games the young man has caught a ball. Well, that's consistency, and don't anybody ever tell you anything different? Luck. Luck and staying healthy and being on the field. And being on a good team. Yes, you have to be on a team. The ball. It plays into the ball games. Quickly, the pocket collapses on Cochran. 
first man there is Seaman. There you go, there you go. Yeah, it's Jason Seaman right there does a good job of beating his blocker one on one. But I think this is what you were talking about, Chris. If you don't throw the ball down the field and have some success stretching it, you're going to have a lot of them out of there. It just keeps coming. That, keeps that, coming, coming. That voice you continue to hear, that's Carl Roll. He's the umpire, and he's mic'd out there, and it's interesting to hear how he's telling you, hey, it's... And he's trying to get his jersey out. Third down, 20 yards to go. Oops. Yeah, that movement, it looked like Steve Odom wanted to take off before the rest of everybody else. And that's probably going to be pursuit. Dead ball, false start, number 80 on the offense. Five yards, remains third down. Now, the thing you look at now, you're getting out of field goal range, and Coach Amstutz really doesn't like to go for field goals. I believe they've gone for it over 30 times on fourth down this year. But you have to have a manageable fourth down to go for it. Third and 23. And again, let's see what Clint Cochran can do. He's back, he's got some time. He's got a man, but the ball is thrown short. The defenders were right there looking for Chris Hopkins, but he was surrounded by a couple of defenders. Wendell Brown was the first one there. Wendell Brown playing his middle linebacker spot does a good job of running the seam in too deep. That's what middle linebacker has to do. You're not worried about anything underneath. You turn into man-to-man -man coverage when a tight end attacks the vertical. I don't think that's what Coach Amstutz was looking for bringing Cochran into the game. B.J. Hill back to field. A little fake catch as he lets it go through the end zone. And we have a 7-7 tie. When we come back, we're going to have a chance to talk to a guy who's making a late push for the Heisman Trophy. Yes, Mr. McFadden of Arkansas. He's a big hog. Welcome back again. Ball State and Toledo all tied up at 7 apiece. And joining us now on the phone is a guy who's making a very, very late and strong run to the Heisman Trophy, Darren McFadden of Arkansas and the Razorbacks. And as you compare his numbers against Troy Smith, who of course is the leading candidate right now, Mr. McFadden has done just about everything. And I'm going to let the leader of the Darren McFadden fan club start this interview. That would be Mr. Craig James. Hey, man, Darren, thanks for taking the time. How you doing? All right, pretty good. How you doing? Well, I'm doing good. Sure enjoyed watching you take snaps like a quarterback. You're just showing that value. Yes, sir. Sawyer in the backfield comes out of it. A little guy as quickly. Dante Love was the one who got the pitch. And that's a loss. Hey, Darren, right now, the, the mood of your football team, uh, how are you guys staying focused on your games and not the big picture in the national championship run? Because we, we've been doing the same thing that we're doing all year. Coach tell us take it one game at a time. And that's what we've been doing all year, and we've been doing a pretty good job of it. So we just continue to keep that same mind, mind frame. Darren, what's the feeling like in the locker room after losing the USC in, in a rough way? And I know that you weren't your 100%. You didn't play till late. But did you guys ever question your ability to play? No, we knew we had a good team. We knew we can um, we can go out there and win ball games. It's just after the USC game, everybody was down and things like that. Because we, we had went out there with high expectations of winning, and we we had went out there and got beat pretty bad. So everybody was pretty down. We just came back at the next week just with um, the attitude was going to get better. Well, and, and getting better, you just look like a physical team. Are you surprised? You you know, you're a sophomore. Are you surprised? And how well your offensive coordinator has done, uh, Coach Gus, coming from high school this year, making the adjustment to the college game? Yes, sir. It's, it's real surprising because coming from the high school ranks to college is a big difference um, with the play calling and things like that. But he's done a, he's done a um, great job at it. Do you think about the Heisman Trophy, Darren? Um, right now, I don't too much think about it right now. I'm just trying to finish up these last couple ball games and trying to get to the SEC championship. You don't think about it a little bit when you start hearing your name? Um, when, well, when I hear my name and things like that, I think about it, but I, I try to put it in the back of my mind to try to stay focused on the ball game that we have coming up. You take a look at the BCS standings, and you can see your Razorbacks in that number seven position. A lot of things would have to help happen, rather, to help you guys to get up into that one or two position. But you guys are primed right now with a chance to get to a BCS game. That's got to be your focus right now. Yes, sir. Well, right now, like I say, we're trying to take it one ball game at a time, but that's, that's always in the back of our minds to get to a BCS game. 
But right now, we're just trying to take it one ball game at a time. Darren, what's the best part of your game? Um, well, I have to say my offensive line blocking for me and me just hitting the holes. Well, you sure, I sure enjoyed watching you play, man. You're a heck of a football player. Stay focused and uh, keep throwing the rock to your guys, man. That'll keep that safety off of you in the running lane. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, Darren. Good luck, buddy. Thank All you. Right, thank good you. luck. Thanks for joining us. Darren McFadden of the Arkansas Razorbacks. And a great young man. Huh? Well, it was man. just to, to watch, well, to hear him talk about his offensive line when he asked that question, you know that he's a great young man. But to see those direct snaps to him and then him tossing the pass, I mean, on the money, he can do it all. You know, you're starting to see that little, little single wing. Pretty soon everybody's going to have a name like Scooter and Biff. <laughs> It's a single wing, dude. I'm telling you, that's what it is. But, but, but let me, look, Chris, you know the challenge now. It's, this is a game of matchups. The Arkansas Razorbacks. Offside, number 94, 94 on the defense. Uh, the offense yard breaks. Penalty. The huddle. The quarterback's in the huddle, but he goes to wide receiver, and McFadden goes to quarterback, and you've got you've got Felix Jones, who's another good running back that he fakes. He's running the zone read, just like Vince Young did last year, but he's a better runner than Vincent Young. Well, it, it's, it's a weapon you definitely have to have, oh, but yeah. I'm telling you what, if I see a direct snap on yeah. Darren McFadden, I'm going to hedge my defense and hedge my bets and have a predetermined defense in there that I go to right away because, you know, even though he did throw the ball, he's not going to make the living throwing the football. He's carrying that mail. Keep those guy on. Parmalee with it, hits the hole quickly, and again busts his way into the secondary. A great block up front, 11 yards on the carry. Well, just to pay off McFadden, I, I think he's in a neck-neck tie with me for college football's most outstanding football player with Troy Smith. It's is, awesome. Is that right? I, really, I said last week I thought he was three. I mean, and it's just, uh, he's a heck of a player. It's good vision right there by Parmley, and he gets a nice block from his tight end, Chris Hopkins. Very good. Right, now, there's bad vision. He had the hole outside. He cut it up too quick inside. Wait, wait a minute, linebacker shoes. <laughs> what do you mean? Watch this. Watch his eyes now. He's Mr. got high tops. The ball's got, he's got eyeballs on his shoes. I know he does, but the eyeballs need to be pointing here he because get, right there. How's he going to get outside that guy that's right there in that leverage you gotta, there? you got to give him a leg and take it away. <laughs> Cortland Booker is in there. you got to be able to make a guy miss once in a while, Craig. I'm a true duffing. He's protecting the running backs, you know. Yeah. They never do anything wrong. <laughs> Cochran's still in at quarterback after Opelt was ineffective. Parmalee takes it and tiptoes along the sidelines before he steps out of bounds after a gain of six yards. Well, again, I, I, I like the fact that, that Parmalee has room on the outside, uses his speed, and doesn't try to cut back up too early. He's wanting to get out there, run, and just had a little blow out there on the turf. Yeah, and interesting, this is not the field turf. This is the old school turf, and, and we see where priorities are on the offense, <laughs> right? This, this, is, this is that turf when the coaches just walk around, they spit the tobacco juice, and you can see it on the carpet. Oh, yeah. that's nice. Yeah, just like at a home. Cochran tosses it outside to Davis. And Davis picks up the first down before Trey Lewis brings him down. 11 yards on the game. Yeah, just a recognition by Cochran right there. And that was a BC blown coverage on Ball State. Davis is going to sneak out in the back, and they got three levels. They got one mid level, one deep, and he throws it to his running back who can do the most damage with the ball in his hands. A great call, good recognition by Cochran for the pickup. Collins in the backfield. He takes the handoff. Nothing up the middle. Tries to break it outside on the left, but is met by Eric Keyes Woo! right away before he's swarm tackled by just about the entire team. He needs to start charging, charging the mission for that ride. Thanks. <laughs> Four yards on that pickup. How about that? Look at the power and the strength of Collins when he gets to the end of this pile he just keeps moving and you know when you try to strip the football you're not getting the legs that's three yards yeah. that's that's momentum that's passion and that's great effort playing and, and a guy fighting for carries I mean he sees Parmley get in there and get some carries and, and and Davis and says hey don't forget about me two tight ends in there is Collins again in the backfield a little fake Cochran rolls out to his left Passes it over to Chris Hopkins, and he'll have a gain of six yards. 
Todd, it's an interesting situation starting with Aaron Opelt, the freshman, and, and, and now then going with Cochran. They just feel he's more effective? Well, no question. Click Cochran, you put him in the game and you're not missing anything, certainly intellectually. This is a guy that comes to Toledo with a 4.6 GPA. That's on a 4.0 scale, high SAT scores. He's a bioengineering major and he's running a 4.0, so he probably will not be working in broadcast television with us. <laughs> so he drives those big trains, huh? Collins takes a pitch, breaks it. Before he's knocked out of bounds, John Greco is there to set up the block, which opened up the 15-yard game. And, and, and the big guy, talk about the footwork. Look at him inside here, pulling Greco, 79 around the outside. And you'll notice how he's able to get downfield and lock up on a corner. He does a good job of recognizing he had a choice. Do I help my buddy with the cutoff block or do I continue downfield? You made a great point, Greg. It's tough for those big fellas to get down and block those corners one-on-one. -on -one. And Toledo loves the red zone. The last five games, they're 14 of 16 in the red zone. 13 of those times were a touchdown. I'm still trying to figure out, and when we come back, we'll talk about how do you get a 4.6 on a 4 point uh, Easily, scale? you get a teammate that gets a 2.3, and you get a 2.3, and together you come home with I want, a 4.6. I want Todd to explain that to me when we come back. Good Thanksgiving. <laughs> ESPN 2's College Football Primetime, brought to you by the new LS, unprecedented, allnewls.com, and ESPN Game Plan, Maximum College Football. To order, call your pay-per-view provider or log on to ESPN.com. Search Game Plan. Back here in Toledo with a 7-7 tie between Ball State and Toledo. I want to go back down to Todd Harris to explain to me how you get a 4-6. I got a 4-6 if you add up three years. <laughs> I knew you guys wouldn't get that. 4.6, you know, 4.0 straight A's, which I know Craig James got all through high school. 4.6 is when you take advanced placement. That's AP, not Associated Press. Advanced placement classes, getting those extra points, extra credit. Well, the last three years I went 1.2. <laughs> <laughs> Juan Collins with a nice run of four yards. Eddie Burke is there to stop him. <laughs> you know what? It's not about how you are at that moment. It's like that old teammate of ours used to say, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, Collins is right there because I, I love the fact, this is what I, I love about college football, when young guys or guys that you don't expect get an opportunity to make a play and make something happen, he's running with passion and with purpose. Three tight ends out of the shotgun. Cochran has it. Nice. Oh, oh, fires it nice. perfectly into the end zone to Chris Hopkins. He just has such poise and confidence. And uh, Hopkins beats Keys, the arguably Ball State's best defender. And Hopkins beats him on a little square end. Here's the Flutie magic stuff here for you. Watch Cochran, how he moves his feet. Doug always talks about get up in the pocket, step up in there, step up into your throw. Nice catch coming across by the tight end, Hopkins. Leading him just enough, so there's an easy, easy reception there. Steigerwald for the extra point. High snap, but he gets to it, knocks it through. Current snap was a little bit high. You see right here, it's man-to-man -man coverage, and Keyes has got caught looking back at the quarterback, and Hopkins does what they do, what they call a little bit of a wrap route. See, Keyes has got to understand he's going to run out of room one way or another. You have to take away that inside because if you have any help, it's the outside and you have the end line as your 12th defender. But as soon as you look back down there, that little margin of looking back can cost you a few extra steps. Hopkins beating. 14 to 7, and guys, obviously, Opelt is a young man who's going to be here for another three years. But the change, obviously, the coaches knew what they were doing. Amstutz has been doing this a while. Yeah. You know what? And this is just as Ball State and, and Coach Hoke have done with their quarterback situation. you got to figure out, you know, competition is the best thing in the world for yeah, you. Yeah, and Clint Cochran from Wadsworth, Ohio, is only a sophomore. So they're going to be battling out for a couple years. And as you said, Craig, that, that will just make them better. And he's got to keep his mind into it and stay mentally tough and not get frustrated. It looks like right now they, uh, Coach Amstutz has decided that Cochran has a hot hand and you got to ride it. He has, a, he has a good presence in that pocket. I know Doug would agree with that. 
I'll Flutie, tell you who doesn't like it. It's Doug Flutie. Flutie keeps text messaging me <laughs> in my pocket. My, my phone keeps going off. Flutie's like, I feel left out. I miss you guys. <laughs> and he's also saying, I don't like that switch of the quarterback stuff. <laughs> Moss is back there across the 15. Nice cut to get it to the 25-yard line. Let's go to the studio and check in with Scott Reese. All right, John, thanks much. Coming up on the Sports Center halftime report, Bob Knight in hot water once again after making physical contact with a player during last night's game. We'll have the latest major repercussions at Florida State after the Knowles were shut out for the first time in 233 college football games, and the Washington Nationals have named Manny Acta as their manager for next season. Much more at halftime for now. Back to John in Toledo. That's interesting about what's going on in Florida State because Bobby Bowden was very vocal saying he did not want any changes, especially his son getting fired. So it is resignation by Jeff Bowden, but that's the very interesting. Bostic with the carry there. Thanks, guys. I mean, when you are in Tallahassee, the mayor, the governor, the king, everything is Bobby Bowden. So you expect that they are going to bow to his wishes. Now, a lot, a lot of people have been very critical of Jeff over the years, and the offense has suffered. So I guess he just decided he, he couldn't take it. It was time. I mean, it, and how difficult it is it is it for the coach to have a son taking so much pressure? And and I think it's one of those deals, Chris. It had to be done because they're, they're right now something has to change at Florida State. Well, I got to believe that the son made the decision because Bobby has, uh, to me, he has earned the right. If the yeah. problem is with the team, then it's my responsibility to fix it. If you're yeah. going to let me have that responsibility yeah. like I deserve, then I say who I fix it with. Yeah. And if I want my son to be the coach, you got to trust me that I will fix it with him. Now, then maybe maybe the son said, Dad, I'm a burden. I'm an anchor. I don't know what happened, but right. that's, and that's what we've got to conclude. You have a new president there at Florida State University as well, so that may have had something to do with it. Nate Davis goes to the sidelines, and out of bounds is Terry Moss. The flag on the play. Yeah, he got smoked. He got hit late. Well, I'll tell you, that pass, that's a difficult pass when you're throwing from the back hash to the deep corner on a rope. But, you know, the Florida State deal, they're, they're down right now. They have athletes, they're young, they're down, and they've been hearing about Jeff Bowden now for years, for years, including from guys like me. I've said things before about Jeff, and it's... Roughing the passer, number 89 on the defense, 15 yards, automatic first down. But, and it's not, it's not just Jeff Bowden. You know, it's not just his situation. You know, guys have to make plays there. You know, to me, though, again, if you're going to say, Bobby, you brought, brought us this far, you put Florida State on the map, you can fix the problem. Then don't tell Bobby Bowden how to fix the problem. Let Bobby Bowden fix the problem the way Bobby Bowden sees fit to fix the problem. Bostic fights for just a couple of yards, and you know what might be interesting is if the first call Bobby Bowden gets is from another son, Terry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, I hear there's an opening down there in Florida State. No, no don't, 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 don't take the call, Bobby. <laughs> uh, but, but you know what? Here's where it comes in, the problem, I think, Chris, for, for Coach Bowden. Yeah. Bobby's now got to deal with all this negative publicity in the midst of recruiting. The uncertainty, the uncertainty of where is Biden going to be the guy? Is he going to be here? And all of you know that Florida and, and those schools in, in Miami, they're all recruiting against Coach Bowden right now, saying he, he's not even going to be there. You don't even, you don't want to make a commitment to him. Well, absolutely, it hurts recruiting. And don't think that those schools don't use that. And it's all fair. And, and re, the war of recruiting, and you, you've got to say that. Is Coach Paterno going to be at Penn State next year? Who knows? But you use that as, as a tool. What's happening up at Michigan State? Who's going to coach that program? Big Ten schools. I heard you play. were. I, you know what? You need to. You need to go out there and go get about 11 guys in high tops on defense. Yeah. <laughs> then I miss doing this with you two. That's. <laughs> we'll be talking about you. <laughs> Davis out of the pocket has his man across the middle. Love is going to take it to the end zone for the touchdown, 39 yards on the game. And that was just a picture-perfect pass and play. Well, what it was, it was this pick. Darius Hill does a good job of being an unselfish player, and they pick off Walter Atkins. And Love just sets it up. It's all about patience. Love is just going to be a little bit patient. Here comes Darius Hill. Watch a little pick right there. 
Bam. Oh, it's Whoops, just I got him. You got him. Nobody's got him. That pass you're talking about, John. Ball let the receiver stay in stride, in motion across the field. Nate Davis with his second touchdown pass of the game. Brian Jackson for the extra point. And it's up and good. Love with his second reception of the game. We've got a good one here. Perhaps a precursor to the game that is coming up on Saturday. The big one. We've got a 14-14 tie here in Toledo. Back here in Toledo, John Saunders, Chris Spielman. Rick James, Todd Harris, in a 14-14 game. That drive, only five plays for 75 yards that ate up just over two minutes. So with 2.54 to go here in the first half, you've got a 14-14 tie. It's an excellent call, too. Again, Darius Hill occupies his big body. Watkins lost vision. And a nice little rub play, as you called it, Craig, was set up perfectly, and Love exploded after he got the ball. Nobody was going to catch him. Yeah, those offensive guys call it a rub. You defensive guys call it a pick. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Richard Davis and Steve Odom are deep, awaiting Brian Jackson's kick. Again, it's going to be short. Drops and bounces into the hands of Davis, and he gets outside for a nice little pickup on the return. Eric Keyes, the man who got him. Saturday night ESPN and ESPN 2 offer up two important college football games. First on ESPN 2 at 7 Eastern. 14th ranked Wake Forest, 9-1 for the first time in school history, hosts the 19th ranked Virginia Tech Hokies. Then on ESPN at 7.45 Eastern, Heisman candidate Ray Rice and 7th ranked and undefeated Rutgers try to keep their national title hopes alive as they take on Cincinnati. Judgment Day presented by Remington on ESPN and ESPN 2 on on Saturday, college football lives here, and of course, you can get those games in HD. Cochran rolls out, has his tight end Josh Powell, and hits him for a first down. Chris, we don't see often, very often. Hold it right here. I'll show you at the front here. The three-four defense. Not often do you see a lineup where you've got a true three-four defense, do you? No. Straight well, up. Well, you start to see it. It's making a little bit of comeback in the pros. Not much in college. But a good job of Cochran getting his head around on the bootleg, going to his first option, the middle crosser, and throw a strike. Again, hit, he's gaining confidence as the game progresses. All set up off the play action. Parmalee, the lone back, and there's what you're talking about again. Cochran wants to go deep this time, has his man. Beautiful pass to Chris Hopkins, who pulls it in, and another big gainer. And we're talking about Darius Hill, the tight end for Ball State. Well, Chris Hopkins say, hey, don't forget about me. And that's a big, nice route by the big fella running a deep corner. Here, here it is. He's going to come in, and he's going to go back out. And there's that play action that you've been talking about, right? Well, here's Bending yeah. hard to the middle, back to the out. It's a deal on that. If you're a defensive player, you can hear play action. If you don't hear grunts and groans coming from the big blue pants, you know it's passed, even though it looks like run. That was a 27-yard pickup, and this time they hand off to Parmalee, and he's tackled in the backfield. But the ball's being thrown downfield a little bit more. So that eventually is going to have to loosen up Ball State, or they'll just keep throwing it, and they're having success throwing the ball down the field. Second down, a loss of one. So 11 yards to get a first down. Cochran has been very effective on this drive. Parmalee in the backfield. Right there's Hopkins. He split out a little bit. There he goes. And they roll it out. Got him. Ball is incomplete. Now he had him. He had him on a corner route if he were to throw him open. I just didn't stay patient enough. Is there a reason my back's hurting standing next to you? I, I, I think I'm nervous, because you've hit me in the booth before. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm fine here, but what? He's open on the corner out right here. See, he doesn't let that time develop. And again, if he throws to the back pylon, pylon and throws his receiver open, there's six points. <laughs> you're long, you're never wrong. <laughs> I got hit a couple of times too, Craig. I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know. I'll be all right, guys. It's kind of like, you know, the cold front coming in or something. <laughs> Cochran, quick drop, but Scott hands in his face immediately before he drops it off to Parmalee. And Parmalee fights his way with a pickup of seven yards before Tom Keller is there to get him. 
So you get this aggressive defensive front that's coming after you, and an excellent play call by Toledo, taking advantage of that little screen, little dump it off, get it into Parmley's hands. And Parmley did a good job of being patient because the timing of the screen was screwed up because Parmley was out there in front of his offensive lineman, did a good job of running the sidelines, letting the big fellas catch up. And again, Craig, he cuts it back inside. This is unusual for Tom Amstutz to go for it. The last five games, only one field goal. But they are five and five <laughs> season. Play clock. Steigerwald is a kicker, but he called timeout. They hurt. You know what? Amstutz hurts Billman. You know, and he's thinking, you're right. <laughs> you're right, big tenor. You know, this guy on the sidelines has done such a tremendous job, but he's also a, a guy who's a lot of fun to be around, Todd. Oh, John, no question. You know you come to those towns and some of the coaches welcome you with open arms and other ones just as soon you get on the plane and leave. Well, Coach Amstutz is one of those guys. How many coaches take the time to give you a tour of their office? That's exactly what he did. ESPN, hello. Welcome to my office. Uh, as you can see over here is our uh, 2005 GMAC Bowl Championship Trophy, something we're very proud of here at the University of Toledo. Now, not just the trophy, guys. He carries a samurai sword. He keeps this in his office. Actually, he told me he uses it for cutting fruit. He also collects antique lures. That one's from 1910. And here is his most prized catch, his family. Coach Tom Amstutz, they call him Toledo Tom. You know you've made it when you get a bobblehead doll. And last night on Monday Night Football, our Susie Colbert mentions him when she's talking about Gretkowski, the Tampa Bay quarterback. Uh, the guy's big time. He's ready to break out, John. He's ready for his own movie. He's, the, he's Toledo Tom. He's equal to Borat. I mean, this is a guy who <laughs> never left his town. Borat! Borat meets Amstutz. 36-yard <laughs> attempt by Steigerwald, who's 5-5 five and five on the season. And you can make that 5 of 6 on the season. That ball never seemed to get up. There's a little penetration up the middle, which sometimes is getting a kicker, kicker's vision. It looks like he hit it well enough. Pushed it. Oh. Pushed it to the right. Look, waiting for that draw. Started to draw. It drew late. Yeah. Looks like one of your tee shots. Down the fairway. <laughs> through the fairway. <laughs> into the next. We're under a minute to go here in the first half of what's been a very good Mid-American Conference football game between Toledo and Ball State. Four wideouts here, but it's given to Larry Bostic underneath, and he fights his way for a couple of yards before Sean Williamson and Mike Alston are there to come up with the tackles. Good half of football. Again, you see the two different types of teams, a throwing game and a running game so far. Tied up. Coaches are going to be content to let the clock run out and half come to an end. 14-14 in a game that is important to both of these teams. Toledo trying to make it to a bowl game. Ball State trying to get to that 5-3 and three mark. Right now, let's go down to our Todd Harris. Coach, 14-14, how do you take control of this game in the second half? Well, we got to run the ball better, and then defensively, we gave up some big plays. Uh, you know, the big run, you, we can't do that. Got to fit the defense right, and, you know, we got to control the ball. Your thoughts on your young quarterback? Well, he's pretty special. We think he's going to be a daggone good player for us, and he's got good poise. He's been hit a couple times, but he's hung in there. Thanks for your time. Thanks. John? Todd, thanks a lot. Coming up on the halftime report, Scott Reese, Bob Knight up to his old end, perhaps the Cy Young winner in the National League, and looking to the big game. Scott. Well, welcome back, and as Craig James and I drove into Toledo, we were very, very pleasantly surprised to see just how beautiful this campus is. And another good reason to come was we got a pretty good football game here. 14-14, John Saunders, Chris Peelman, and Craig James. And in this tie, you got to look at a young quarterback who we talked about at the opening of the night, and boy, he is not disappointed. Nate Davis is a freshman. 
And he has come out here tonight, and he has electrified this offense. The young man has a cannon for an arm. The coaching staff told us that he was strong with the arm. He's made throws stepping up into the pocket. He's bought time falling away from the playing field. He's thrown it 30, 35 yards on his back foot. Yet Toledo's had a little answer for him as well. Yeah, Jalen Parlamy right there showing big size, power, and the speed to finish off and outrun DBs with a score. Then they make the quarterback change. They go with a guy that they're a little bit more confident with, Clint Cox. Cochran has come in and added the vertical passing game to this offense. Well, you take a look at what the quarterbacks have done, and again, remember, Clint Cochran did not have the full first half to work with, So, but 7 of 9, I'd say, is pretty efficient, and 8 of 16 for Nate Davis, but we've seen just how impressive that arm is. Well, Co Cochran in the opening game against Iowa State this year had 39 completions, yep. which is second all-time in school history. Only Bruce Gradkowski had more in a game at 49 once. So it's not like he hasn't been able to do it before. He's had some injuries he's had to deal with. Now he's back. So, uh, you know, I think, and he did, Chris. He gave him some balance on offense. Yeah, just he brings a sense of presence to it. You can see, you know, the quarterback has to have trust not only of his coaches, but he has to have trust of his teammates. And right there, you see that there's a little bit more trust trust and belief in Cochran as opposed to Opel right now in this particular ball game. Look at these stats from the first half, and I have a feeling that on the ground they're going to favor Toledo. Just just a hunch. Armerly he had a big one, so yeah, yeah, the stats on the offense, boy, you, you know, they, they they ran that one so fast, just about like that graphic did. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, uh, the running game of Ball State is that just kind of like they're delivering a gnat in Toledo's face. See, here it is. It's going to be around the buggy just enough, but we're slinging a rock. That's what we do. Parmalee and Davis are deep. Brian Jackson with the kickoff. And again, it's relatively short, picked up at the 10-yard line by Davis, who goes to his left, sees an opening, tries to hit it, but is brought down quickly, cut down by Larry Bostick. Again, now Toledo has to come out. They're going to be heading, they're going to try to establish the ball on the ground, and all of a sudden, they have the play action that's set up off of that. But another way to get the running game is start throwing the ball first to open up the lanes for the running game. Parmel, Davis rather. No, Parmley in the backfield. Hopkins and Powell, the tight ends. And Clint Cochran, still a quarterback. The handoff goes to Parmley. And he muscles his way before Coroma pulls him down, picking up just two yards. Normally right now, 13 carries for 133 yards. Yeah, I'd be impatient with it. You know, you got to stick and you work. And Cochran's throwing the ball, play actions there. But uh, you know, I have a problem with a one or two yard gain. You just got to stay with it. When you want to give yourself manageable third downs, this type of offense. Back to pass is Cochran. This time has to step up in the pocket. Dumps it underneath to John Allen. And Allen breaks it out for a first down, 13 yards on the game. We've been talking about the Scarlet Knights, and the three of us here believe that if they finish unbeaten, they should be playing for the national championship. But look at what Coach Greg Schiano who's, has done to this team. People who haven't followed college football have no idea what a doormat this Rutgers team has been for years and years and years. Nobody's showing up at games. No reason to show up at games. No bowls. We're going to talk to Coach Greg Schiano in just a moment. He's joining us now. And Coach, first thing i got to say to you is we looked at your schedule at the start of the year, Doug Flutie, myself, and Craig James, and said, you know, this, this could be a 10-win season for Rutgers. Did you have the idea that you could be this good and a chance to go unbeaten? You know, you never know when you start a year, and I'm not one of those kind of guys that tries to predict it, but uh, I did feel good. I felt like the things were coming together. We had great senior leadership, and we had a bunch of talented young guys, and that's usually been a pretty good mix over the years. The power that you all play with, to me, that's what makes you legitimate, Coach, is that is it's, it's not finesse. It's not, you know, little ratchety plays here and there. You're a physical team. 
Well, that's what we try. That's the design. You know, we think we can run, run well, and we think that we can get after it, and you know, play with high energy. That's our whole, our whole deal. Just keep bringing it and uh, keep chopping away, and, and eventually you're going to tire people out. Coach, I know you're going to be chopping the wood Saturday night against Cincinnati, and I had a chance to do Cincinnati earlier in the year. And it's going to be a great game that I can't wait to watch because I know on defense they're going to come after you now. They play hard. There's no doubt. You know, I think there's a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, the way we play, we're in similar systems. And uh, Coach D'Antoni does a great job with, with his football team. They play it the right way. They play hard. They play clean. And we're looking forward to a great game. Coach, I got, I've always been a guy, a believer, that you got to build a fence around your state as far as recruiting. Has this success helped you build that fence around New Jersey? Because I know New, Jer New Jersey uh, uh, produces great high school football players. Well, little by little, we've been doing that, and uh, hopefully this last season is going to really help us do it because and the one thing that's special about this location is there's so many good football players and so many guys with grades, and, uh, you know, what a great combination that is. Coach, I know it is the tendencies of coaches to be diplomatic, but I'm going to ask you if you won't be for the time being. If you manage to run the table and finish unbeaten, the three of us here say you should be playing for the national championship there should not be a one loss team ahead of you would you agree with that assessment i'm going to do just what you said i'm going to be diplomatic <laughs> and uh look we got you know i think it was chris who talked about uh, about cincinnati we got a huge challenge in front of us and that's where our focus is and uh we're going to hope to be one and oh at the end of this weekend has mike teal made enough progress now and and confidence in his game that he can take this if you have to and win it in a shootout well, Mike's getting better, and, and I think Mike's had a good year. I think our receivers are starting to grow up a little bit. I think that's the more important thing. We've been playing with, uh, you know, three or four true freshmen and a couple of uh, sophomores out there, and they're starting to come together. I'm, I'm excited to see it. I hope we can we can keep developing. We see Rutgers at number six in the top ten right now, BCS top ten. But we talked about you guys keeping the recruits from the state of New Jersey. You got a pretty good guy though out of New York, I believe, from the town of New Rochelle. Yeah, we got a couple, actually, yeah. Uh, Ray Rice, you're talking about, doing a great job. And his two high school teammates, Courtney Green and uh, and Glenn Lee, both, uh, you know, doing a great job. So to have three guys off one high school team, it, it's really special. Well, you got to end the season. I know you've got games to go, but, but this is a season where you end at West Virginia. And, and Coach, the recruiting at this point has to be going outstanding. And, and what are the kids saying when they come through to talk to you? Well, it's going well. You know, uh, the one thing that we did is we, it, from the very beginning, we've only recruited what we call the state of Rutgers, and that's New Jersey, New York, a little bit of eastern PA, and then the three counties down in South Florida. And for that to happen and for us to keep doing it, uh, I think it's really starting to pay dividends now. All right, Coach, keep chopping the wood, man. Sounds good. Thanks, fellas. Yeah, thank you. See you, Coach. Continued success, and he has done a job that people, again, if you have, don't follow college football in the Northeast, you have no idea what he's done he basically raised that program from the dead well, the interesting thing I was to say that I, I had a chance to talk to somebody from Rutgers and he has a I believe a couple now this is just hearsay but a couple thousand dollar buyout on his contract a couple thousand or a couple million a couple hundred thousand excuse oh, me okay. <laughs> okay a couple hundred which is nothing no and, and so he's certainly going to be a hot prospect and if you think about that Greg Schiano been in Miami. People yep. are talking about that part of the country. If something would happen to Coach Paterno, he doesn't want to coach anymore at Penn State. Well, I'll tell you what, they don't want to hear about that in Piscataway. It's dropped by Odom. The wall picked it up and then has a little open. Nice stiff arm at the sidelines. Finally, Eric Keyes gets to him after a 14-yard pickup following that 52-yard punt. There's a look at the Glass City. We'll get back here in a moment. Here in Toledo, Ohio, one of the more famous art museums found around the United States. Big tourist attraction. Now, Odom is brought down by what they like to call a horse collar tackle in I'm interested, in the National Football League, this might have been a penalty. Do you think they should institute this in college as well as keys with the tackle? Well, you see his leg get rolled up underneath. And I, I know, Chris, you play defense, and you're trying to bring somebody down. But, boy, it sure be good if they could get rid of, you know, have that rule in college to protect the ball carriers. I guess I could learn to live with an intentional horse collar again, but that would be hard to determine by the officials. They have enough decisions. I, I look at it like this. 
a guy is running full speed. He gets a, a stiff arm to the face. He has one hand in front. And he's doing anything he can do to get his job. The guy down, he's bringing that right hand around, grabbing anything that he can grab. And there's an open area for you to grab there. I don't think he's intentionally grabbed him in the, behind the neck to get him down. But I understand the concern of because of the injuries that do happen. Yeah. Riley Larimore was there with the sack. So second and 14 now for Clint Cochran. Parmalee in the backfield, takes the pitch, tries to follow his black blocking, loses the ball, but it goes out of bounds. Wendell Brown was the one with the hit. No gain on the play. And Wendell Brown's a little bit fired up. Part in the game here where, where both squads now are just kind of out there. Old momentum's looking for a bench. I used to tell the kids when I coached them, he's in the middle of the field right now. He's looking for somebody to go join. <laughs> well, and, and, and again, but it, you could say, okay, the adjustments that were made on the defensive side of the ball. <laughs> I told a kid one time, so I was, really, I was coaching a baseball team. I said, old Mo's looking for a bench. And a guy goes, little kid, Mr. James, who's, who's Mo? <laughs> And if he's old, he can't play in a little league. <laughs> Six defensive backs, as they know that this one is going to have to come out of the hands of Cochran. He runs, just tries to get it back to the original line of scrimmage. Pickup of seven. Darula was there with a big hit, and this quarterback took it. Here's a, here's a nice job of, of Cochran. Now, what he's got to do right now is keep his eyes down the field when he's scrambling around and you have long yardage like that. A lot of times, trust your receivers to come open. He made the decision, in my opinion, to tuck it and run pretty quick. He took a nice shot there at the end, too. You're supposed to slide, aren't you? D.J. Hill calling for a fair catch. Underneath it, grabs it right at the 20-yard line. So Ball State will go to work. 31 yards on the punt. 9.51 to go in the third quarter. Welcome back to the Glass Bowl. 9.51 remaining in the third. 14-14, Toledo and Ball State all tied up. And you see just how close we are to the Michigan border. And that's why the Buckeye and Will Ring Shop does such brisk business, especially this week. It's a house divided, and this store is divided right down the middle. They're both given the same amount of space, but you can tell when you get inside, Ow. these kids Ow. definitely have who they're picking for. Ow. It's a cool box. Go back. <laughs> a fine job of parenting right there. A little high five. Coverage for that game, by the way, begins at 2.30 Eastern time on ABC. We'll have an hour pregame leading up to the big game, and if ever a game deserved an hour, it's this one. Ball State going on the offense, and Nate Davis, that quarterback out of the gun. Bostic is the back. Spins. He got his quarterback out there blocking for him. Nate Davis doing a nice job and a nine-yard pickup before Barry Church had him. Craig, have you been getting any more text messages from Doug Flutie? No, he probably went to bed. You know, how did he get to his beauty sleep? You know what? He didn't go to bed. He's joining us right now. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, how are you doing? Pretty good. Pony's not hallucinating this week, is he? Seeing things <laughs> That's right. that aren't there? <laughs> no, he hasn't said, I think I saw a touchdown <laughs> thus far. <laughs> Doug, we're missing you, and we know that you're getting ready as we watch big run up the middle by Bostic before he falls down himself. We know you're getting ready as we are for Saturday's game. What's your take right now? Who have you given the advantage to in Ohio State or Michigan? Well, Pony's been jumping on the Ohio State side, and I've been jumping on the uh, Michigan side for a little bit, but that doesn't mean those are our picks. Right now, I think Ohio State has to be favored because they're so explosive offensively and can do the things they do. And with the 21 interceptions, turning the ball over defensively, holding teams under the 10 points, you got to give them the edge going into this. Well, the quarterbacks, you know, they match up pretty well, and and, and you've got to have great quarterback play, especially you got to have leadership when you're on the road in Columbus. Chris, you've played there, and it's a tough place when you don't, you know, when that quarterback goes in there, he's got to have uh, some poise. 
you know, you see right there with, with Troy Smith, and I know Doug appreciates this, is that the fact that Troy Smith has been so effective is because he disperses the ball to talented wide receivers, and not guys that just catch it, guys that can catch it and make things happen with it, specifically Gonzalez and Ginn Jr. You know, Ginn's making all these big plays for him, but Gonzalez has been steady and consistent on the other side. And the, the amazing thing, he's thrown four interceptions all year. You can throw that in half of practice. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's amazing the way he's been so efficient with the ball as well as, and he's not babying it. He's not being careful. He's throwing the ball down the field and they're making plays. So, I mean, they're explosive. Doug, everybody knows about Troy Smith, but Chad Henney has a group of receivers that makes him a very good quarterback as well. You know, they've got the big play potential with Arrington and Manningham having the ability to just, you know, when the situation calls for it, put the ball up for grabs for those guys and let them go make a play for you. And, you know, I say it every week when we see his touchdown passes. He doesn't get cheated on them. I mean, he's slinging the ball down the field, big chunks, seam posts, over the top, all those type of throws. He's got a big time arm. Well, the other thing, too, is now Arrington's kind of a guy that's come on late. It started out with just Manningham and Breston, and all of a sudden, Manningham gets nicked up a little bit. Adrian Arrington springs onto the scene with big plays, and the one guy that's been a little bit inconsistent for them has been Stevie Breston, Doug, with some drop balls, but he's come on of late, so it's a great matchup all the way around. Talent you know, is everywhere in that field. You know, and, and Manningham's just getting healthy again and getting back into the swing of things. Well, if he's they can have all those weapons available. Yeah. Um, you know, plus you put Mike Hart in there, you know, into the mix, running the ball, and that's that's the key to it. Can they run the football with Mike Hart? And he, they're so physical a team, both offensively and defensively, that that Michigan competes. They can compete even if things aren't going well for them. They're going to be able to compete because of how physical they are up front. You know, Doug, I, you've watched this game here tonight. Ball State young quarterback freshman Nate Davis. What do you think about his arm and ability? Oh, yeah, you know, I have thrown off the back foot and slinging it up in the air for 35-yard <laughs> touchdowns, things like, you know. I, he, he just flicks his wrist and the ball takes off. It's really impressive. And we saw him against Michigan, uh, you know, the game he had there, keeping it close and giving him an opportunity. Um, he's going to be good. Hey, he's Doug. Have you ever known a quarterback not to use the seams to throw the football? Uh, no. <laughs> not re I, I know I've heard of someone that did it, and I can't think of who it was. But uh, it's an advantage to grab those laces and, and, and spin it, put a little more rotation on it. That just means he's got big hands. He can just grip the ball anyway, and he's looking for a consistent grip. And for some reason, he likes it better that way. Yeah, you know what, and, and he was doing it even in, in pat and go and, and throwing the ball in warm-ups. He'd take that thumb and put it on the seams, and he does have big arms. They've got good, talented receivers. And Cochran, now on the other side of the ball, Cochran here has come in after having a knee injury and, and uh, leg injury, and now he's out playing pretty good for Toledo. You know, he looks like he pushes the ball a little bit and doesn't really turn his, you know, I don't know, the natural throwing motion. But the leadership he's bringing to the team, you can just see the management of the game and the way the guys rally around, you know, it, it just creates an air of confidence, you can tell. And he's, he's been very efficient with the ball, making the throws, putting it where he has to. Well, Doug, we'll look forward to seeing you in the studio on Saturday. We know your wife's a little bit under the weather, so we send our love along to her and you and your entire family. But we'll see you Saturday for that big one, because I don't know if you know it. I may be letting you know right now, because the bosses may not have called you. We're on the air at 2.30. <laughs> Coverage <laughs> begins for an hour. All right. <laughs> All right, man. See you, Doug. Hope Lori gets better. Uh, thank you, guys. Take right. care. Have a good one. Doug Flutie, if anybody knows about slinging the ball, it's that guy. Well, and, you know, he does. He likes to move around and make plays, and uh, and that's exactly what Nate Davis does for Ball State. Well, you take a look, too, that it gives us the – Doug is really the example of some of the smaller quarterbacks. Troy Smith isn't the tallest guy, but Troy Smith has the knack to find the open throwing lanes and angles, and you learn to develop. Sometimes you got to go three quarters. Sometimes you got to come over the top. you got to do it any way you can do it, and Doug certainly did it any way you could do it. Incredible player. Third down and 10 now for Toledo. Cochran gets hit as he releases the ball, headed for Chris Hopkins, incomplete. He got hit hard. He was pressured by Cortland Booker. And just as he released it, the ball popped out. Fourth down and 10. 
It's all about Ball State having trouble in the third quarter, John, throughout the whole season. They've come out, they made their adjustments, and they're answering the challenge of their head coach, Brady Oak. Let's come out and play the third quarter and take the fight to Toledo. And so far, even not on the scoreboard, they have taken the fight. They missed a few open passes deep. Mm -hmm. That would have helped them. B.J. Hill with the fair catch after the 41-yard punt. So look at the Bridges leading to Toledo. We got a tie. Welcome back to the Glass Bowl. Toledo, the Rockets, they started things pretty strong, like a rocket out of the ship. Jalen Parmalee, 92 yards on the touchdown run, running behind his big left tackle, John Greco. And then they bring Clint Cochran in. Touchdown pass to Hopkins, but yet Nate Davis had an answer for that. Well, absolutely, and Nate Davis has been on time and on target, and what set him apart from any other true freshman, at least that I've seen this year, is not only his accuracy, but his poise, and the fact that even though he moves around, he moves around well, he keeps his eyes downfield and gives his receivers a chance to get open and make a play. Never seems to panic in the pocket, just takes a couple of steps up, and as you say, looks downfield. Gonna pass again, got plenty of time. Now he's got some pressure. But he finds his man a gain of six yards on the play. That's what he needs to do is get back to managing. The last two series, there have been a lot of downfield throws. Get back to managing the game. Take the five-yarder. Well, he does because get his confidence back a little bit. Even though he's been accurate for most of the game, a lot of those throws that were downfield, he had receivers behind DBs, and he was just a little off on his accuracy. They'll go down there and throw it again now. Dante Love with that last reception. And again, he's looking to pass, and again, this time it's underneath to the big tight end, Steinhaus, and a five-yard game. All that is, they have kind of a double tight formation, two bunch two bunch formations, on, on, and what they're doing is clearing out, and Steinhaus is just going to kind of sneak across right there. See, everybody's in there clearing out, and just enough to get yourself a first down, and again, this builds confidence in a young quarterback. Hit the short passes, then we'll go ahead and let you let her loose on the deeper ones. Ball just inside the 35. Bostic in the backfield. Takes the ball and quickly bursts through a seam across the 50 and the 40 before he's finally brought down by Terrell Herbert. Big block by Gerberry. 40 yards on the run. Larry Bostic is 5'7", 189, and I bet he's not 189. Gets hidden and hides right behind the blocking. Nobody comes clean, but that's what the five-yard little passes will do for you. Absolutely, and when you have a running back that makes a decision and then has a burst like he does in the offensive line, moving the line of scrimmage, as you said, Craig Hyden, he can make something happen. Bostic again. We talk about coming out in the third quarter, and what and Brady Hope wants to do is get his team to play better in the third quarter when they've been outscored by a lot so far this year. And so how do you build trust in that? You guys, you want to run the football? I know we didn't run it in the first half, but let's come out and start taking the physical battle to Toledo and see what we can do on the ground. And that does open up so many other things. But I maintain a lot of it's been opened up because they throw the ball a lot. Quick little flip out to Boston. Fights his way across the 15-yard line for a gain of seven. And he's now gone over 100 yards for the game. Ramsey was in there to open up that hole. Not a power sweep team, more of a finesse and get angles on blockers and hats on hat and stretch and let the little back find his hole. And what you're starting to see is you're starting to see the offensive linemen down the field five and six yards, and they're changing line of scrimmage and reaching the second level defenders. Davis again with the pitch to Bostic. And again, the little guy fights his way for a couple of yards. You know what you're seeing? Tired defense. Oh, exactly. you know what? Yeah. And there's a tempo. And and Ball State coaches said that in practice, no, what they do on, is no. in the third quarter, they're trying to really work tempo and practice to get ready for the third quarter. And you can see the results here. You see the results. If you look at the defensive huddle right now, there's the leaders offensively for Ball State, but I'm looking at the line of scrimmage of the defensive linemen and all of them hands on hips, legs crossed. Davis looking at the end zone at first, then has a man underneath, Sawyer out of backfield. 
just a two-yard pickup, but we also have a flag on the play. Yeah, that's number three on a roughing the penalty, roughing the quarterback call on Church. That's number three of the game. That's third of the game, correct. Yep. And I, if it's a little bump, then I, you know, uh, me being a super aggressive testosterone man, <laughs> let him play. <laughs> you know, if you hit him, hit him. Rushing the passer, number eight on the defense. Half the distance to the goal, automatic first down. And part of that's just being a freshman. You know, there, there's a lot of youth and the inconsistencies that, that comes with that. You've got an aggressive player. you just got to learn where, what to and not to do. You yeah. can't throw the bone to the chin. You're going to get called for it. It's more like throwing a pinky to the chin strap. <laughs> that wasn't an elbow. Ball inside the five. Bostic had an opening for a moment. Busted through it, but he was hit hard by Steve Morrison. But, but you know what? It's got to be more than, than a chicken bone because you're going to see his chin move. Oh, yeah. Turns the head. Blow to the chin. Blow to the jaw. Yeah, you could tell. Man, I don't know how I don't know how he got up from that one. <laughs> <laughs> Offense, ah. defense. <laughs> Bostic <laughs> fighting his way towards the goal line. But I do, I love the idea of them coming up and taking the fight to Toledo. And look. Look at the guys on team. Hands on hips. Hands on hips. And, and, and this is a young Ball State offensive line. We showed you that in the open. And there, there's there's some freshmen and sophomores up there. Only one senior on that line. So there, there's a lot of youth that they're having to play with up there. And yeah, the big fellas, they get off the ball nice, too. They get off quick. And it, it's amazing the amount of confidence that grows with an offensive line if you do decide to run the ball and you run it successfully. Third and goal, the ball inside the one-yard line, and a great defensive stand by Toledo. Again, Morrison steps up and plugs the hole. Yeah, it, it takes too long. Bostic is back too deep for this short of play without a lead blocker. There's no lead blocker. He gives the ball. There's nobody to cut off Church. Now, what they're hoping was Church was going to go around with the quarterback, Davis, on a fake, but Church completely sold out for the run, and that's what you get. I, I say you go for it on fourth down right here. Well, you're on the road. They're looking for some points. Now, like we said, there's been a lot of back and forth, nothing happening there, and so I, I kind of agree with that. I go with the points. Imagine that. We disagree. <laughs> what a shock. Brian Jackson with the attempt of 18 yards. Buries it right through, and Ball State grabs the lead at 17 to 14. Now, Ball State has played extremely, extremely tough. You'd look at their record and, and think that this is not an effective team. But that play against Michigan could have sent the game into overtime. And I thought it was pass interference. Remember, we're sitting yep, in the studio? I, I thought it was you. pass interference. And then late that late pass there. So Michigan holds on 34 to 26. But they've played into the Big Ten, three teams. Very nearly beat Indiana, lost to Purdue, and then Michigan, the second-ranked team in the nation, they take them down to the final seconds of the game. Well, the thing that was impressive about that is that Michigan and, and Coach Carper admitted this, maybe substituted a little bit early, and it shows you that you can't sleep on a team like Ball State. And it says a lot about that man and how his team responded by, hey, they don't have any respect for you. They're putting their backup guys in right now. What are you going to do about it? And Ball State answered the challenge. And you've grown up in this part of the country and being a Big Ten player, you know that the MAC has a lot of players that are right on the cusp of that Ohio State program. And man, they're going to come out and they're going to give you that. They're going to give it to Absolutely, you. Absolutely, Greg and, and John. The beautiful thing about the MAC conference is it's gotten stronger over the years because of the 85 scholarships. Right. And, and to be honest with you, the fact that they're on Tuesday and Wednesday nights on our, our ESPN family helps them promote their program and coaches mm -hmm. and players around the country see that this is great football. And facilities now are being placed in all of them. Every school's got good, good uh, facilities. You can watch Bowling Green in Miami tomorrow night. Another Mac matchup. Well, this is an important series for Clint Cochran. He needs to come out and they need to get they need to get back a little rhythm in their offense. They've lost the running game. Well, how they, they got their passing rhythm going a little bit when they bring the big tight end Hopkins involved in the throwing game. It's all set up. A lot of it was set up off of bootlegs. Or also they had some success with a quick little rollout. And Collins is back in there running back to do a nice job changing it up in the first half. 
Toledo hasn't scored in the third quarter in their last three games, and only seven points in their last six games. So they really need to get something going here. There's the boot. Cochran finds Powell. And he busts it out for a first down, a gain of 11 yards. And that's what we were talking about. How are you going to get back in rhythm? You come out with the bootleg. You've been running the ball in first down, running the ball in the first down. They do a nice job, the Cochran does, of holding the fake to Collins, coming out late, whipping his head around, and finding the first open receiver. Now you got this big fella over here on that left side, Cochran Greco. Collins in the backfield. Cochran looks like he's changing things up. Hands it off, and Collins fights his way for three yards. Ooh. Well, Greco, you're talking about a block down. The big fella at left tackle, here he goes. He's over on this side here. Watch how he gets the leverage coming down, and I'd say he finished the guy off. He gave you a little bit of a crease there. Yeah, absolutely. He does a great job of finishing the guy off, as you said. And Cease right there did his job of getting in his gap responsibility because even though Greco knocked him down, he also cut the guard off. He knocked his own man down. Handed off to Collins again. Fights his way for a gain of eight. DeWalt opening the hole. And this is what Toledo's defense needed, guys. We saw the hands on the hips, and right now Toledo's offense has reeled off a couple of nice first downs with a mix-up of pass and run. Coming to the end of the third quarter here. Oh, Spillman's got his hand up in the boot. You don't do the fourth, you guys don't do fourth quarter huh? oh, <laughs> this man. broadcast? I better get my shoulders ready here. You may get me in the fourth quarter. Fourth quarter, man. I, get... I know Flutie would do fourth quarter. Well, yeah. I'm, well, I'm here. I'm... No, no, Flutie. Flutie's goal is to have every game come down to a tie. Yeah, so there there you go. Go. Throw a hill, the drama club got it right. <laughs> the drama club or the, the local asylum, I'm not sure. 17-14. Hi, I'm Tony Paco, home of the Moed. Welcome to Toledo and enjoy the game. You are looking at Tony Paco as an institution in the Toledo area, and for very good reason, made famous by Klinger on MASH. If you remember, he sent home for some Tony Paco's dogs. They sent them all the way over to Korea. And you sign buns when you go there. They say they've got the softest buns in town. Not so sure, but there's a lot of famous people who have been there. Lou Holtz, the coach, stopped by heaven. I'll tell you that, Moad fellas, half-pound Frank, covered with all kinds of goodies. Mother of all dogs, the Moad. I highly recommend it. It looks like a heart attack on a plate. Not to worry. It is. It may turn you into a dragon. You eat those onions. DeJuan Collins in the backfield. Cochran, who's done a nice job with this team. Oh, quickly, Collins with a good oh. burst of speed before he's hammered after a nine-yard gain. Wow. There's the umpire, Carl Lowell, taking a shot. We've been listening to Lowell throughout the game. He's Mike. Let's see if we can hear him anything here. Like, ah! I'll tell you what, he did a good job of using his feet and his hands to protect himself, and he bounces back up. That's that's why he's the umpire, not one of those those back jumps you guys back there. Took a blow to the head. Came up looking for the gash. Collins again with the carry, three yards. Wait, I, had a, I had a teammate in New England one time. Two plays in a row, he ran over the umpire because the umpire had called holding on him. I was going to say that was and no you know accident. What? He got it called again on the second one, and on the third time, they had to take him out of the game. That umpire said, dude, you are finished. You hit me like that, you're done. He's still, he's still checking out. I'm surprised he didn't throw a flag on himself for getting hit in the head. Move your feet. Stay low. Good job of using his hands. First and ten for Cochran. A pass across the middle has his man open. Nick Moore has another first down. Well, that's a nice read by Nick Cochran or Clint Cochran. Hopkins, a big tight end, clears out the middle and it gets those linebackers jumping up. Number one rule if you're playing zone defensive is linebacker. If there's one in front, I guarantee you there's one behind. And a good job of protection and patience by Cochran hitting the receiver coming across the middle. Nick Moore. Collins the lone back, and he takes the handoff, immediately is hit at the line of scrimmage. No, no, no. 
Portland Booker, the first man there. In order to be successful in the running game, the backside block many times is the most important. Hopkins at tight end, 91. Watch him on the backside over here. Poor footwork. Balls away from him. Make sure you get in there. You see him stop his feet. He started leaning. you got to get the helmet on the inside or at least mid, at the middle of the middle. And he was mad. Knows he made a mistake. So Parmalee is in the backfield now. Cochran going to pass. Parmalee with a nice block. Oh, and a oh. nice pass, but a better hit. Hopkins had his mitts on it. He had it completely. It looked like it was going to be a touchdown potentially before he gets blasted by Alex Nip and knocks the ball free. Yeah, take a listen to this now. This is how you did, did separate. The ball for the receiver. And what they did, they ran a little shake route. Throws the linebacker, Wendell Brown. But Cochran threw the strike, and that, you have to have confidence to here. make that ball right in there. Because you've got to throw it in between the safety and the corners. You know, and, and I know a lot of people would say, well, you know, you're going to get hit, catch it anyway. You have to really practice when you catch the ball. Time and time again, as soon as you get it in those hands, you've got to get it tucked. It's just a hard bang-bang play. A nice job by the secondary putting the wood to it. Good job by Cochran allowing the shake route by the tight end to develop. Right here. There's Hopkins right there. We'll see how he responds to that hit. Third down and 10. We got a whistle. A good time out there by Coach Hoke. A lot of unorganization on the, and Time uncertainty. Out. Ball State. Their first timeout of the second half. Right now, Ball State with a 17-14 lead, trying to protect it. And 2HD presented by Pioneer Plasma. Now, I was always under the impression that there was Gatorade on the sidelines, but Todd, it looked like they were testing for something else. Yeah, Alex Nip was put the huge hit on just a moment ago. Watch this collision. Boom! Well, he had to take a knee, and they made him come off the field, and they put him through a sobriety test. <laughs> he passed, so he's back in the game. Beautiful. <laughs> Keep it simple, man. It's the old concussion test. Cochran. Ball was deflected. They had what he wanted right there. They had a nice little zone blitz on. He had a receiver on the hook up wide open and an opportunity to tie the ball game. Good third down defense. When you run third down, you run blitz. What you're doing is you're forcing the offense to blitz control. That means you have to get rid of the ball to the hot area. Ball deflected. Toledo attempting the field goal. Steigerwald, five of six on the season. He missed one from 36 yards. This is a 39-yard attempt. Got enough distance. And it's good. Well, we're talking about that big Michigan-Ohio State game on Saturday. What's interesting is that you have guys who are teammates in the National Football League that cheer for one or the other team, like a couple of guys on the Green Bay Packers. I mean, there's nothing that even comes close to being the best rivalry in sports, in every sport, regardless, not just football, all of college sports, I think it's the best rivalry. Everyone around the country will tell you about it, and, they, uh, and they're all watching. That's true. That's true, and, and this rivalry goes uh, so far back. You know, I think, you know, uh, Ohio and Michigan were fighting over Toledo. You know what I mean? So it, it runs true. deep. You know, it runs deep. But the game, the game itself, I think is uh, unparalleled in, in college football. And for me, it was the greatest time of my life, being a part of uh, going to Michigan and playing in this game. And uh, it, it'll be great for the guys this year. Well, Charles knowing his history. Well, the big game is coming up on ABC and HD. The coverage begins at 2.30 Eastern time, presented by Best Buy. And then at night, Cal against USC, almost as important, especially seeing as USC right now is number three in the BCS. And Charles Woodson, another Ohio product, O-H-I-O, Ohio product. <laughs> 
that well, somehow he went to Michigan. Crossed the line, didn't he? <laughs> went there and won a Heisman Trophy, and he's going to be watching Troy Smith try and do the same. Terry Moss busts up the sidelines before he's being pushed out of bounds. You know, in a game that, of that magnitude, that we're, we, at the intensity, Chris, I always find that, it, that a lot of times you get a game that's built up and, and, and it's so much pressure and intensity in the game that big plays happen because the defenses, they're good. I mean, you, you get defenses out there and they're flying around in intensity, and all of a sudden, bang, somebody breaks behind them. Well, in Ohio State, Michigan, first of all, you're going to see a great defense in Michigan. The front seven is as good as there is in college football. Ohio State replaced nine new starters. They get better and better every week. But a lot of times, a player's legacy at Ohio State or Michigan is defined how he plays in the Ohio State-Michigan game. Davis to Dante Love. By the way, you know where Bo Schembeck was from? Ohio. Barberton, Ohio. Let me tell you. I wonder what Michigan football tradition would it be without like without Ohio. I, I asked a question one day. I was doing a chat on dot-com ESPN, and, and I go, man, all these Michigan receivers, where do they come from? They all look the same for years and years. Big, tall, thin guys. And they go, then they, all the Ohio people jump in. <laughs> They're all from Ohio. <laughs> well, they, they must be in a hurry to get out of the state. What's up? <laughs> That's what makes the rivalry great. Hand off to Bostic. He's Fights his nice way job. and weaves his way. Greg Hay is there with a tackle, but not until Bostic picks up six yards. Yeah, Craig, I know you appreciate this for a guy his size with a passion and deceptive power yeah. that he's bringing to the table. Mike Hart, Ray Rice, smaller in size, height, runners, defensive guys, y'all aren't used to striking a zone that low. You know, you can't get your hips that low. Again, he fires yeah. through the hole. There's just a, a small opening there, but when you're that size, you can find it. Well, and two, he, I think people get caught up, well, can this guy hold up or can that guy hold up and carry the ball 20 or 30 times a game? If you look at work done and what he's done over his career, and the greatest back that I've, in my opinion, that ever played the game, Barry Sanders, mm -hmm. and the one thing that Barry had and a lot of guys don't is that Barry rarely took a hard, direct shot. And I'm seeing that, I'm not comparing Bostic to Barry Sanders, but he's not taking that direct hard hit. He's kind of getting tugged and drugged down as opposed to getting smacked down. Golly, what an arm. Terry Moss with the pickup again. Just a quick release. Nine yards in the game. His trajectory Remind Ben Roethlisberger's taller than Nate Davis. But I remember the first time I stood behind Ben and watched him throw the ball in the, in the path of from up, down. Right. And, and, and so does Nate. Nate's got that same trajectory, and he's got a, it, it's It's getting there. Yeah, he's not Mr. Roboto either. It's nice and fluid and smooth. You don't need to break the oil can out before he throws the ball. Bostic fights his way out of a tackle and gains himself some yards he had no business getting. Eight yards he pulls up before Morrison was over there to pull him out. Well, here's the unique throwing motion of Nate Davis. You're going to see right there with Craig circling. The seams, what? Laces out, Finkel. Well, laces are out there for Nate Davis. He does not have the grip of the ball with the laces. And look, that's a little Terry Bradshaw ask right there with the pointer finger on the tip. He's got huge hands. And and even, like I say, watching him in, in just throwing the ball around, not taking a snap, he, he may put a thumb over the seam. And he what, throws it anyway, gets it in his hand. It'll play action. Now he's in some trouble. Still spots. Look at the arm on that. I got a fan. <laughs> Throws it into the front row. Kid caught the ball at the goal line. Pressured by Alston. Nice job. Look at the young guy. That was a good catch. Does he get to keep it? Why not? <laughs> you know, I mean, if you know, why wouldn't you? Can you keep a foul ball? In the Arena League, he's got it. Look, see, he had the hand. He had the ball on the seams. He doesn't like that. So he switched it, which you rarely see, to where his hand is off the sleeves or off the uh, seams. Yeah. He's a player. And a nice job not to take a sack. Hand off to Bostic. Quickly brought down by Greg Hay mm -hmm. for a two-yard loss. That's a big play if Hay's not coming hard. A lot of times that's a run blitz. You're going to really stop the running game. 
And Hay from the uh, opposite side, you see him coming across from the right going left. If Hay doesn't come down hard on that, that's a big play. And say so the great effort to lay out because he really couldn't close the gate in front of the ball and get his helmet across, but he's able to seal and squeeze. So a big third down play, third and 12. Davis out of the shotgun. He's going to loft it towards the end zone. Great coverage down there. The ball was intended for love. But it was into double coverage and bounced off the helmet of Mellon. Well, he does a good job right here of not looking back at the quarterback and times it up perfectly. He sees the hands go up, then he goes up and plays the hands and avoids much contact. What you'd like to see is a little look and lean off of that. <laughs> Brian Jackson with a 42-yard attempt. He has made one of 18. So let's see the strength in his leg. He has a long of 52 this year. Well, he never got, never got the foot through that one. Fell down, slipped. Plant foot slipped, came out from underneath him. He hit it fat like a divot. Yeah, look like you out uh, trying to go in from 100 yards. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to get your foot on the ball when you slip like that, so we remain tied at 17. Maximum college football. To order, call your pay-per-view provider or log on to ESPN.com. Search gameplay. And eBay Express, where you'll always find it new. eBayExpress.com. Nice look at downtown Cleveland. Are they the Rockets? The cheerleaders? Would you call them the Rockets? Because well, yeah, the team is the Rockets. The Toledo right? Rockets. Parmalee in the backfield. Quick toss out to the sidelines. Cochran goes out to Stephen Williams, and he gains five. You want to take a look at this kick again of Brian Jackson, the attempt. He... He's coming through the ball, but he slips just before he gets there. Now, now Chris said that looked like a nice soccer tackle, which is pretty popular around here, Todd. Yeah, no question. Speaking of soccer, the women's soccer team here at Toledo made their first national NCAA appearance in a 12-year history after they defeated Northern Illinois 2-1. to They claimed the MAC title. Congratulations to them. Unfortunately, they lost in the first round of Villanova, 5-1. A look of Jordan at Toledo, Mac champions. Always nice. Now I wonder if we're gonna take that and put it in the coach's office instead of out in some display case. I put it in the office. Go champs. That's why I let that trophy go. That G Mac trophy staying. I'm sitting right on his desk. Conversation starter. Three wide outs to the right. Cochran, flush out. We got a flag in the backfield. He's looking for Parmalee on the pass. Well, they're in a perfect coverage for the screen right there. They're in a two man. That means man underneath with two safeties deep. And plus, you have the back covered man to man, so there's no creation separated. The offensive line was late getting off, and there was no one to throw it to. Well, Parmley's had a, a, a strong night. It started really, really strong with the 92-yard touchdown run, uh, but it's cooled down. You know, in the second half, you see the six, the six carries and 17 yards, and and it's just kind of gone. Brett Kern with the punt, the low line drive, fielded by B.J. Hill, who has an opening, splits a seam, and gets it up near midfield. 46-yard punt, 17 yards on the return. We were talking about find a display case for this thing somewhere, not on the coach's desk. Welcome back as we take a look at the Mid-American Conference standings. And last weekend, well, my alma mater of Western Michigan took it on the chin to Central. Close, toe-to-toe -to -toe fight, 31-7, to I think is how it came out. But uh, Central Michigan on their way to the Mid-American Conference Championship. Central Michigan's got a good football team. We watched them oh, early this yeah. year against Boston College. Oh, they nearly beat them, too. Boston.
Bostic in the backfield. Four wide. Davis steps up, finds his man. Moss, and then Moss does some work. Let's check into the studio with Scott Reese. All right, John. Hey, what controversy? Michael Prince and Bob Knight and the Red Raiders all smiles as they get set to go against Arkansas Little Rock. We got college hoops. They push the tip time back 10-15 Eastern time right after football from Toledo. John? Thank you very much. Scott, we'll look forward to that one. Bob Knight, of course. I thought that was blown out of it. Don't you think that I was do. blown I out of my portion? You know what? The mom, the dad, the kid are okay with it. And um, I thought what Coach or, or Dickie V said about it was, hey, all the night haters are going to get all over him. You know? But, but, but my, po my point is, if it's anybody other than Bob Knight, it doesn't lead sports center it's not on pictures yeah. nobody pays any attention to it it was a little love tap to the chin trying to encourage a kid who apparently really really doesn't have a lot of confidence right. look me in the eye look him in the eye and, and yeah i don't have a problem with you know who you play for that's right hand off underneath the bostic he's gang tackle so you want to go back a couple plays on, on the confidence and you look at Davis and what a great athlete he does not look to run right there on a big pass play that sprung Moss he waited for Moss to come open the linebacker left him because he thought it was a threat of run and just waited and delivered the ball on a nice touch which he's worked on when he first got into camp Craig he was throwing too many bullets now he's developed a touch that makes him that much more dangerous look at all that movement Ball State, one of ten on third down conversions here. Going to the end zone, looking for it all. Great defensive job back there by Nigel Morris, who just reached up and tipped that ball away. A bad decision right there. Not the bad way to throw the ball, but because the ball was late. Then don't forget you have a 6'6 guy. Now you let him go be 6'6. Don't let him be 5'10 or 5'11. Throw it up there where only he can get his hands on it. And at the back of the end zone. You know, you let the guy get up. And, and, and again, nice defense. That pylon back there. Now here's Brian Jackson who slipped on his last attempt. But he's one of 20 semifinalists for the Lou Groza Award, too. Good kicker. And this one just 27 yards. Ups, and this time he does not slip and knocks it right through to give Ball State the lead with 6.27 remaining. Last time the plant foot of Jackson slid out from underneath him, so this time he just kind of very firmly, aggressively drills it right down the middle. Look like he skipped on this one, didn't he? A little bit, yeah. He right after. Trust his training. He just wanted to make sure. And remember, this is not what we see all over the country as far as field turf. This is that old school AstroTurf, and it does get us a little slippery when it gets moist. Last week, uh, but Northern Illinois, Toledo at Northern Illinois, we were on the field before the game talking about players coming out real early. And, you know, there are there's so many different turfs, you've got to have, you got to figure out the right shoes for it. Right. Now, kickers are kickers, right? You know, they, they have a tendency to go over and, you know, do some goofy, you know, yeah, I, out there. I, Come on. It's, yeah, I mean, then you put it right back down in the yeah, wet spot. Exactly. Getting over 50 yards back <laughs> to the middle of the field in the wet. <laughs> They're kickers, man. Leave them alone. My question is now, I know he's got that kicking shoe on. But couldn't he wear the same type of shoe on the other side? Would it, it, wouldn't he run wouldn't better? Be a kicker. No, but wouldn't you run better if you had the same type of shoe on both feet? I think it's all about the plant foot and why certain kickers wear certain shoes as far as he felt that that would give him the best possible plant, and which obviously maybe he made a poor decision. <laughs> yeah. like he's got an old coach's shoe on. <laughs> the kickoff, again, is going to be short. Davis hauls it in at his own six. Across the 15, up to the 20 yard line. Alex Nip was there with the tackle. We talked about the Mid American Conference and their championship. Here's our KFC Bowl Buzz, and that's Mac Bowl Affiliations, Motor City, December 26 on ESPN. Mac against the Big Ten. And the one I'm looking forward to from the town I was born in, Toronto, Ontario. First bowl played outside of the United States, the International. And the Mid American Conference will 
represented during the bowl season in December. Still going to be four downs, right? Uh, yeah, they're not okay. going to change the rules. Carmelie across the 30, then showing his speed. First to speed to the 45, up to the 47 before he's knocked out of bounds. 26 yards on the carry. Yeah, you know what? When you start getting a bow in the defense and no penetration, nobody coming to the football, that's a lack of mental focus and intensity. Well, they had a lack of contain. And any time there's a running play, you always have the outsides taken care of so you don't get beat around the corner. And there you see the emergence of Parmalee. He does keep getting stronger. You keep giving him a rock, and he has the ability to break. But great vision right there to find the opening and hit it. Parmalee just went over 1,000 yards on the season. Takes the pitch. And this time has nowhere to go. We're in Toledo, Ohio for Ball State and Toledo. Right now, the Cardinal leading by a field goal. John Saunders, Chris Spielman, Craig James, and Todd Harris on a very nice night in Ohio by Ohio-Michigan-type standards in mid-November. Hey, you know what? The weather could be a factor on the game Saturday. Oh, what's it going to be like, Chris? 44 and cloudy. No, no moisture? Not yet. Depends what Woody orders. <laughs> Cochran runs with it this time. I'm telling you, this guy, he picks up nine yards before Wendell Brown gets him, but somebody needs to talk to him about how quarterbacks are supposed to go brace. down. You know what? If you've got a brace on your leg and you slide, it just doesn't feel like a slide. So he's going to go ahead first. All right. Coming up next, that CPE <laughs> Classic. We're going to get to see the Red Raiders of Texas Tech. Slide, young man. What, did, what was it Doug Flutie told us? No when it's over. No when the play it is, is over. over. It's over. It's over. Can't run on that one. Sacked quickly by Caroma. And the poor decision right there. If there's nothing down the field, you know, you live to play at fourth and two, has a, 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 taken a sack and going back to fourth and ten. Right here, there's nothing open. Fine, throw the ball in the dirt or throw it toward the general area and get rid of the football. Do not take a sack because you take yourself out of making the decision whether to go to it on fourth down. Now you have to punt the ball with 3.57 to go and counting. The change of possession, the clock will keep running. Kern kicking to Hill, who calls for a fair catch at his own 10-yard line. 42-yard punt. No return. So now Ball State, with a three-point lead, is going to try and grind out these last three minutes and 47 seconds. You, you know what's on my mind right now? That Paco hot dog. I, was, that, I, was, I knew it was Paco food. or whatever it is. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Don't, man, you know what? I, I could I could do two of those right now in a heartbeat. How about you, Spillman? <laughs> yeah, I, I could, too. And I'm just seeing why Ball State should take their time there now. The clock started running. And let it run. Yeah, yeah, Paco, I'll be there. <laughs> Give me a second to get through this game first. I'll be there first in line. And hold the onions. Yeah, because yeah, I got to ride with you to Detroit after yeah. the game. I don't want to be in a car with you. Well, Toledo has three timeouts left, and this is where you got to start thinking about it. <laughs> in, in Ball State, doesn't want to play too close to the vest here. Go with what's been getting you there. Run the ball, throw it. Take your time, though. Use as much clock as you can. Well, let's see if Nate Davis, the freshman quarterback, lets the clock bleed down to that two seconds before he snaps it. Well, Ten. See? That's eight very precious seconds they could have eaten off the clock. And a good job right there of staying in bounds. Let's check in with Scott Reese. All right, John, this was the incident from last night. Bob Knight and Michael Prince, and a lot of controversy over that tap right there. You can witness the aftermath for yourself. Texas Tech tipping off against Arkansas Little Rock, 10-15 Eastern time, right after football. John? The young man's chin barely moved. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying you should be out there hitting kids, but again, I think reputation is what Chris said the focus it. on that. Chris said it. Know who you're playing for, and that's his style. And that, that mom, dad, and that kid were okay with it. Mm -hmm. I got no problem with Coach Knight on that situation. Would you have a problem with this? Was, this question was posed to me on uh, ESPN Radio today. Would you have a problem if that was your kid? 
if I, if my kid went to Texas Tech to play for Bob Knight, he went there knowing what he was getting yeah, into. Absolutely. If my kid was a quarterback who played for Steve Spurrier, you'd know what he was getting into. You've got a tough, hard-nosed guy, but both of those coaches are successful with hard, aggressive styles. Let me play devil's advocate here quickly, guys. What would happen if Coach Mike Krzyzewski did that? Would that be a bigger story on SportsCenter, or would it still be because it's Bob Knight? I think it, I think it would be nowhere. But I saw the story, Todd. Uh, I was watching Outside the Lions with Bob Lee today, right? And and they had the Roy Roy Williams incident right. in North Carolina last was it last year? And and that was kind of out of character for Coach Williams too. No big deal. Well, I think there was there was an attempt attempt to get his. Hold on, attention. you got a problem with the clock. Yeah, I don't think there's 30 minutes left in the game, which is what it says on the game clock. All right, divide that by 10, and we have the appropriate time. Well, and again, what's at, what's at stake here? Both of these football teams are playing for something. For Toledo, it's to continue the streak in that second half season and to become bowl eligible. For Ball State, it's to go five and three in conference play. And don't forget, Toledo did miss a field goal, a makeable field goal earlier in the second half. Big third down. Somebody moved, it looked like. Nice job by Davis to get it out to Moss. It's a huge play by Davis because he fumbled the snap coming back. But again, we're talking about a true freshman's composure to hang on to the football and maintain his pocket presence. See, the ball was snapped early. He wasn't looking for it, but the big hand snag it in and fires the strike. Flutie, Flutie called back in already, and he said those gloves are cutter's gloves that are really tacky, and that's why he didn't have to great, great grip the laces. Man, Flutie needs to put in for, he, he's a four-man booth tonight, you know? Yeah, he's working. Gerberry, the center, kind of moved his feet a little bit before he snapped the ball. That's what made me think there was going to be a flag on the play. Bostic with the carry, three yards. As the clock continues to tick down, Toledo with two timeouts remaining. Just the composure to regather the snap. Don't panic. Keep your eyes back down the field and find the open field or open receiver on third down and ten with two minutes to go in the ball game. Outstanding. And you got to see again two timeouts on Toledo side. Boston with 30 carries now for 145 yards. And most of that work coming in the second half. 190 pound yard back. And I doubt that he's 190 pounds. Drop for a loss. We have a timeout called now with 146 to play. Toledo with that timeout. As I said, this a very nice precursor for the game that's happening on Saturday. I seem to remember something about a big game talk. John, we are the hors d'oeuvre. We are the appetizer for the big game, less than four days away. And we were at the uh, Buckeye and Wolverine shop in Sylvania, Ohio. This is big time. We got in there, riots almost broke out. We got divorce attorneys on the line. It's split between houses divided. And the folks there are so busy, they put on their own commercial. And it's a pretty clever commercial. She thinks that we ripped it off at ESPN, but it's a pretty clever commercial. Take a look. I stayed right down the middle. I didn't want to set up the alarm, but uh, the folks in there are serious. We're in there, and the lady had her cell phone. What was it? Hail to the victors on her cell phone. Brutal. That's a great commercial. Don't cross that line. Third down and nine. Very big third down. For Ball State, and especially for Toledo, who's trying to hold on to some clock time left to get out and get back on offense. Davis flushed out of the pocket and just throws that ball. Yeah, he's I'm yeah. having the flag get thrown. I was wondering if he was going to get called for that. Yeah, Rick Hay with the pressure. He did. He, he stayed, stayed in the pocket and threw it away. Well, was he in the end zone when he threw that intentional grounding? That's where the flag, huh? That's a safety. It's a safety, safety because he did it in the end zone. That's right. And that's why the official picked the flag up and threw it back in the end zone. 
You know, we'll take a look at and on the replay and see where he actually delivers the ball. But I'll tell you right now, that's the first time where you saw a little bit of panic in the freshman. Right here, the ball is on the two-yard line. Yeah, he's all right. He's, yeah. he, he let that ball release outside. It's good that the officials are, are getting together and, and conferring about this so they don't make a mistake. Well, it would be huge because obviously the safety of the points, but not only that, it would save Toledo a timeout. Save Toledo a timeout. It would give him great opportunity to get field position since the free kick would then take place at the 20-yard line. But he, uh, Amstutz has a timeout that he can use to challenge. Intentional grounding on the offense. The ball was thrown from the end zone, okay. resulting in a safety. To. Well, the ball wasn't thrown from the end zone. Yeah. So the now, ball was not thrown from the end ball zone. State can challenge this. Or they got to buzz it down from the booth because watch when this ball is delivered. He's on about the two-yard line now. The ball is out of his hands, and he is not in the end zone. The ball has not crossed the end zone. No, that's not even close. That's not. No, but this is why replay was, was implemented. It was implemented to take care of the obvious. So you get a challenge coming. Well, you have to. Now, the only Brady thing... Hope. No, he is not, it's not even close. Well, obviously it's being reviewed right now. Todd, what's going on down there? Well, while they were discussing this and they were making the announcement on the field, Brady Hope was actually watching the Jumbotron here, and what they've done is they've piped in our feed, the ESPN feed, onto the Jumbotron, so he didn't have the opportunity to look at himself. He just looked up the Jumbotron and watched our replay. Now, he didn't have the benefit, like the rest of America, of having Craig James and Spielman tell us about it, but it, nonetheless, he saw that line wasn't near, and he decided, hey, let's challenge this thing. Now, I agree with you. Obviously, he's still in the pocket, which is defined by the tackle box. And he's throwing a fadeaway jumper right here. But the fadeaway jumper takes place outside the lane. I'm getting excited for college basketball. It's coming up right coming after up. our game. There you go. That ball's gone before he's in the end zone. Well, there's a little question about it as we see it. However, as we've seen throughout this year, what we see is not always what the official in the replay booth sees. We know they've got basketball coming up next. Let's check in with Ron Franklin. Okay, John Saunders, little levity going on here in Lubbock, Texas, as uh, Coach Bob Knight takes the floor tonight here at uh, the arena for the Lubbock Regional Final of the CBE Classic and stopping and telling a joke to the uh, officials. And you see the numbers, 879 is what he has to reach to become the all-time winningest coach. Well, there's a little question he's going to get that this year. You know, I wonder if they played Rocky music as he came out tonight. <laughs> came out with some boxing gloves on. But Bob Knight, one thing that you can say about him, he's a winner. He graduates his players. And that, that twosome is, is a pretty good two-step as a coach. Well, certainly uh, what he's done for college basketball. And, and oh, maybe a lot of people don't agree with his tactics, but you know what you hire, and you know what you go and you play for. And he doesn't pretend to be anybody he's not. It's Bob Knight, and this is how it's done. And if you don't like it, then don't hire me or don't come play for me. It's that simple. Todd, as we have the review on the field, where does the official actually go to get the headset to talk upstairs? Funny you should bring that up. You know, we've disagreed with the officials and sometimes when they say, well, they bought a mannequin. Hey, I don't know what it's called. It's just a guy. Someone said it looked like Craig James, but it doesn't have the bulk, you know, the, the cut of Craig James. But it's just mannequin. They put the headset on. He just stays down there the whole field. Doesn't move. Doesn't complain. Doesn't mind the announcers. Doesn't mind the cold. Headset always stays there. So they always know where to go. May not get the decision right, but they know where to go. A lot of coaches would probably rather see that mannequin on the field than some of the officials. <laughs> yeah, look at that. It, it, no pay. He just sits out, rain, snow. It's better than a postman. They got to get him a bigger hat. They had to slice the hat open there to get on that big old <laughs> dummy head. Looks well, serious. 
But I, I don't know unless they're. I don't know what's taking so long. This is my. I hate that. It's been a pet peeve. You go into there and you look and you see it and you make a decision. It's not the official's responsibility either. It's the replay booth that's making a call out there. If look at it. If it's not conclusive, then don't. The play stands on the field. Unless I'm missing something that's conclusive that the ball was thrown before he was in the end zone. Body, and his body was in the field of play. Come on out of there. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to figure why this should take this long. Yep. Because, it, and this is one of the problems with replay. I like it because the intention is to get the call right on the field, which is a good thing about replay. But it shouldn't take this long. And on too many times, I think they get the wrong call. Well, I mean, there's, there's, I don't know what you could what, possibly what? dispute. But you know what? I guarantee you, fans of the Oklahoma Sooners right now are saying the same yeah. thing. You know, we've been in this boat. Yeah. Speaking of Oklahoma Sooners, there's a little, little, oh, I don't know, quiz going around. Why aren't the Oklahoma Sooners ranked higher than they are? Anyway, that's for another talk show. He's done a great job, though. He has. Had After him. review, there is indisputable video that the pass was thrown from the one and a half yard line. It's a loss of down at that point. Ball will be placed at the one and a half yard line, fourth down. Good call. And they took their time and they got it right, which is what replay is for. Outstanding job, men. Well, it, it works in the favor of Ball State, and their coaching staff <laughs> doesn't like it's in replay. Well, but but then again, in, in the big scheme of things, yeah, it, it works for Ball State, but Toledo is going to get nice field position with one timeout remaining. But they have to be ready on the field because once the change of possession occurs, it's rolling. You know, the gutsiest call of all time would be from that real look fake here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Fourth and 31. Oh, they had one open earlier. <laughs> That'll be a tough one. <laughs> Running from the back of the end zone is Chris Miller. He's got to watch his back foot. Ooh, they came after him. Out to the 40-yard line where it just dies. And so Toledo's going to come out with terrific field position. One time I left, just a 38-yard punt, and only needing a field goal to tie this game. Send it in the overtime. Love college football. We haven't had an overtime this year, Greg. Well, that's been, you know, we've been lucky just to get one on time. Now, this one definitely has been. Parmley in the backfield. Let's see if they try and grind out some yards with him. A little reverse play to Nick Moore, and then Nick Moore goes downfield. Oh. Ball is tipped. Nearly had his man, but Alex Nip gets in there, nips it away. Stephen Williams was the intended receiver. You know, I like the call. First down, go for it. Now you got three downs to get your first down and to start moving the chains. Well, it's a gutsy call, and Nick Moore, he's open down here. Nip does a good job of recovering, but that ball had some air underneath it, boys, where he could run underneath it to make a chance. This ball game would be lead Toledo, but the ball was thrown flat. Cochran again throws it out towards the sidelines. The ball is dropped. Steve Odom looked like he lost his footing as he reached out to grab the ball. And at middle of the field, is, is there's some opportunity there. They have a timeout. Toledo has one remaining. And no panic. Two plays here. Two plays. That's what they think of right now. Two plays. Well, again, yeah, he's got to keep it. He doesn't need it all in one shot here. Cochran out of the gun. He's going to need to pick up some decent yardage. Looks towards the sidelines. Has a man open, and he loses his foot. It's Parmley out of the backfield with a gain of eight yards. That might have been a first down if he didn't slip. Well, if you want a tie ball game, here you go. Cochran does a good job. He's covered two of the corners playing off, so he does have Parmley on a swing route to develop seven yards down the field. And after he catches the ball, there's a cover two. You see the corner coming off late. After he catches the ball, he does not have an opportunity to make a move and try to run over and get the first down. Brandon Crawford was the one in there that 
hit Clint Cochran as he released the ball. That's the final timeout by Toledo. Just in case you're wondering, the range. Well, you know what, you, you start talking about uh, range and, and age and stuff like that. The guy that hit for Ball State, the quarterback from behind on that last one is a, is a freshman who's 30 years old, Brandon Crawford. Pretty interesting story about Crawford. Todd, the guy's, uh, he's endured a lot of things and he's made a, a great comeback. Now here he is playing college football at the age of 30, I think. Yeah, Crawford's 30 years old, was in the Marines for a while. And the funny story, the uh, Ball State team was staying at our hotel, and they were going through walk this morning. He was the last guy there, and Coach Hope said, 30-year-old Marine, and you're late for the bus? You get shot for that in the Marines. Get on the bus. <laughs> Says it, that the Marines taught him character and discipline and life lessons, and he's used them. Fourth down, and about three yards to go, a long two. And this could be the game for Toledo. Strike. Oh, and dropped. They had the first down. And Chris Hopkins could not hang on to the ball. Well, that's the guy you want to have the ball. He's been a, just an outstanding player all year. And think he just lets the ball get to his chest. He does not go out and snag it with his hands. He tries to catch it with his palms up. The ball hits his chest like we see so many times, and it bounces right through. All you have to do is use your hands and catch the ball. That's the sixth drop pass by Toledo tonight. You see the histrionics of Clint Cochran, the quarterback. You know that obviously means he wants to win, but... Mm. As, as the guy who dropped the ball, does that bother you? Oh, man. Well, no, no. I mean, he, everybody's out there. That's disappointment. It's not necessarily disappointment in one guy. It's disappointment in the game and not being able to convert. Well, it's frustrating. Cochran did a nice job not playing for a while. Came in and made the most of his opportunity. Tough, tough way to go. And that game is over. Ball State comes into Toledo and wins it 20 to 17. Bostic with 31 carries for 143 yards. Cochran very nearly brought his team where they had a chance. So the final score again, Ball State 20, Toledo 17. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Now let's head out to Lubbock, Texas, as Arkansas Little Rock faces Texas Tech in the CBE Classic. Here's Ron Franklin, the Little College Hoops.